All right, welcome everybody for this first 2024 Rise and Tide Foundation lecture. A um, lot going on, a lot of future potentials emerging, some really beautiful futures, some less so, all shaped by our choice, the choices that we have made, that we will be making, that will deal with our, re our relationship as humans to universals, uh, whether we choose to embrace the love of truth, the love of goodness, of wisdom, and act accordingly, um, and thus not be tragic, or hold on to the 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 roller coaster that uh, has a a little drop off that's been built into it systemically. So that would be a terrible way to roll out the end or roll out twenty twenty four would be to hold on to folly. Instead, we're we're all about overcoming that. And so Maureen just graced us with a little anti tragic. Uh, set of ideas that uh, that I think are really important to look out for as far as thinking about how to refute or or with, both with ourselves, but also with many cynical people around us who have lost a sense of hope, reasonable optimism, and are holding on to a nihilistic view that there is no natural law, that there is no purposefulness, that bad things are, are the consequence of uh, might makes right, and that's all there is. That's not true. That, that you can't understand anything about world history if you think that way. And we can't shape our future if we think that way in any positive manner either. So not only is the future very, very interesting uh, to say the least, but the past as well and our relationship to the past, what sacrifices were made that have shaped the contour of our present situation, which will have potentially more or less value depending on whether we really appreciate those sacrifices or not and act accordingly. And I think that there's something that's been really brushed out of the history books or rewritten. Um, Marty has brought my attention to this. I didn't even know so much. I, I knew of the name Roger Casement. I knew nothing really of his story. So Marty, over the last couple of years, has, uh, has introduced this figure who did so much more than I ever realized in, um, in saving many, many lives. He's going to be playing a big role in Marty's book, which Marty will talk about. And... Um, and I think that it's time that justice be done to the truth and the true story of Roger Casement, what his sacrifices, what his vision was. And uh, and Marty, thank you so much for for introducing this first lecture. Uh, can we run the the clip now, Matt? Is that okay? Yes, sir. Now, first, what we are going to see is a state funeral of an Irish national hero in the city of Dublin in the year of our Lord 1965. I, there are some ironies to it, but first we'll watch the clip, and then I'll explain to you the ironies. Ro roll them. To the Pro Cathedral. After the lying in state at the Pro Cathedral, in, the coffin bearing the mortal remains of Roger Casement is placed upon a gun carriage to be borne in state to Glasnevin Cemetery. President de Valera, one of the few of Casement's generation attending the funeral, almost 50 years after his death. who led the official mourners was to deliver the funeral oration. He spoke of Casement's last wish to be brought back to Ireland. There's Prime Minister Sean Lamas. So the body was laid to rest in a hero's grave. This cemetery, said the President, will become a place of pilgrimage to which young people will come for inspiration. Okay. Hmm. Typical British imperial propaganda. It is apt, it is factual, and it leaves out 99% of the necessary facts and all the context, and therefore it is totally misleading. You look at that short picture, 
and it looks like a small, private, cozy little ceremony. The funeral was attended, we'll give the exact figures later, and I'm holding them off now for a specific reason, by more than half a million people. It was the largest, most popular funeral in the history of Ireland that has ever been held. It attracted more mourners than the official state funeral of Winston Churchill, which De, De Valera deliberately meant to both emulate and excel, ex, you know, exceed with it, which he did in both cases, which had been held only two months before in January 1965. Nor does it mention uh, why the state funeral of Roger Casement takes place 49 years after he actually dies. Nor does it mention how he dies or where he was buried before. He is hanged by the neck and executed as a traitor by the British Empire in the Tower of London in August 1916. Our old friend who we have just discussed President Woodrow Wilson has, of all things, pleaded in vain for the British government to spur Casement's life. The State Senate passed a motion calling on the British government to spur Casement and save Casement's life. Casement has been convicted of treason, which he did not commit, as we shall see, on the basis of a 1381 statute a British law has been on the statute books for 530 years and has not been used for at least for the past 300 years before. And even then, it is deliberately twisted and misrepresented to provide the legal justification for his execution. The people who insist on his execution are the same actual individuals responsible for bringing Britain into World War I, which is the greatest catastrophe in British history. All of this at the same time. And why is he brought back to Ireland? And why is he given a state funeral 49 years later? And why do more than half a million people turn out? Of course, as you saw, there is not a hint of that in that sweet, noble, proper, utterly misleading little uh, 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 movie theater newsreel that we just saw, which was all the British public was fed at that time. What we are talking about further is a man who is arguably, and I would maintain it, the greatest humanitarian in history. He ended not one, but two separate genocides. One of them was one of the largest genocides in recorded history, and the first great, enormous, modern, deliberate genocide. The murder of 10 million human beings and the deliberate maiming by the blinding of their eyes, the cutting off of their hands and arms, or the cutting off of their feet over a 40-year period preceding this in the Belgian, in what is today Zaire or Congo, which was then run by Belgium, but basically operated for profit by them, with the, uh, by the city of London, by major British corporations. And Roger Casement, with a couple of very distinguished colleagues, who also are later persecuted to premature and, uh, uh, or even earlier, tragic ends, exposes this. And it is the first example in human history of using modern mass media and global opinion to bring pressure onto any nation carrying out major human rights abuses to force them to stop it, however long they have been going on. And this technique is pioneered by Roger Casement virtually single-handedly, as we shall see. And he's an Irishman. And even researching this, I, I, I continue to learn new things about him. This lecture I'm giving you is not a summary of his life. It's more an introduction to studies on him because there are many excellent in, uh, studies on him that have been done in Ireland, none in England, of course, none in England, but by Irish scholars over the decades, over the past half century and more. 
But there is much more that needs to be done. And there are the most important secrets are still locked up in the most secret files in Britain, where they remain more inaccessible than the old Soviet and KGB files, which were opened up in the 1990s and continue to be opened up for several years under Vladimir Putin, for that matter. They were opened up, but the most sensitive and important files in British history over the past hundred years still have never been opened up and probably never will be. And this is a classic example of them. We will also find, and this is a little bit embarrassing to go into, because again, we all know if you uh, discuss conspiracies, you are automatically regarded as a conspiracy nut. But Roger Casement was a conspiracy nut. He did not believe in Freemasons. He did not believe in Jewish conspiracies or diabolical ones or occult ones. But he believed in the power of greed and he believed in the power of the city of London. And he had observed it, uh, as we shall see, close hands for more than 30 years but, uh, in uh, high level work, first in the, in the British business sphere and then working at the highest levels for the British Foreign Office itself. He had observed carefully all these things, and he was convinced also that World War I and Britain's involvement in World War I was motivated by simple, good, old-fashioned greed, not run by the banks. This was his, I'm not talking about what I believe or what you believe, but what he believed, that it was not run by the banks or the Jews or the Germans, but by the city of London for, uh, and by uh, their New York partners for profit. And therefore, Two things had to be done. Caseman's entire papers, his enormous personal archive, was taken under lock and key by the British government and remains under lock and key to this day. You can have far more access into all the crimes of the CIA, alleged, alleged alien landings uh, in the United States since 1941. Documents on all these issues have been, whether true or false, have been repeatedly released and discussed and their provenance discussed and the credibility discussed. But you cannot read Roger Caseman's personal papers 108 years, almost 108 years after he was hanged by the neck until dead in the Tower of London. You cannot. It is still under British lock and key. This is a man who began life as a great believer in globalization and the power of the free market to end human suffering and to lift the standard of living of, uh, as the greatest uh, engine ever conceived of to raise the standard of living of hundreds of millions of suffering people around the world. As we shall see, he later abandoned that view. What did he go to instead? He looked instead to the power of imperial British government, a kind, beneficent, well-meaning imperial government that would protect the poor from the, the, uh, and the weak from the strong and the ruthless, from the Nietzschean superman. And as we shall see, needless to say, he later became disabused and disillusioned about that view as well. He was a strong British patriot who came from one of the most na British loyalist parts of Northern Ireland. And he was a Protestant himself. He came from County Antrim, which makes my native Belfast look like a stronghold of Irish Republican sentiment by comparison. Uh, the, uh, people are so hard and fast up there. The most hard and fast Quebecer, and my apologies to all Quebecers who watch this, uh, I, I do not mean to make any inf in, 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 uh, 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 invidious moral comparison with you, but you are liberal moderates compared with the hard men of County Antrim, which is where Roger Casement came from. And yet he ends his life as an Irish Republican and the father of Irish Repub the entire Irish Republican movement and becomes the most revered and important hero and prophet of Irish Republican values over the century since he died and is, is growing more rather than less in stature to this degree. And there is, of course, more. There are Christ elements to this. There is there's Christian symbolism to this. This is a man who was known to be unbribable, incorruptible, highly moral in his day, 
who before he dies is slandered of, and it was universally believed because the power of the British state was behind it, that he was a mass paedophile and abuser of young boys. As we shall see, all the evidence for this was a lie and cocked up. It is still widely believed to this day. Casement, when he was first told about this shortly before he was already, he knew he was going to be hanged, did not take the accusation seriously. He simply could not imagine that they had been made in the first place. But they were made all right. And why were they made? Because Roger Casement otherwise would have won the Nobel Peace Prize. Roger Casement had, in the full glare of world publicity, ended the genocide in the Congo, and been acclaimed by the British people and the British royal family, as well as around the world, as a hero for this. He had been a friend of King George V. King George V had given him a knighthood. Yet at the same time, Roger Casement led a secret life, which he took great pains to hide. Excuse me. I think I need a cough drop or two in a moment or two. Uh, not quite yet, but I bid your, as Rod Sterling would say, I make my apologies to you in advance for that. He had a secret life. It wasn't, uh, and because he referred to a secret wife, life his later detractors were able to say ah this shows he really was a pedophile child molesting monster all along but that wasn't what he was referring to he was referring to also being an irish republican now i've been asked by matt uh, i think uh, both privately in our discussions and uh, in front of this group on several occasions when i moved from being a great admirer of winston churchill which i was for decades in fact Friends at the university used to make jokes of me, about me. And I took, they, they were well meaning jokes, they were affectionate jokes, but they made jokes about me because I was such a, a lover of Churchill, which was not uncommon for young, idealistic, good, good, nice, patriotic British boys and Northern Irish boys of my generation. When I moved from that to withering contempt for him, was it a St. Paul moment? You know, a moment on the road to Damascus. The skies open, a heavenly light appears, an angel comes down to you and whack you're a changed woman or a changed man. Right? And it, well, of course, it wasn't like that at all. As the prophet Isaiah says, here a little, there a little, here a drop, there a drop. One and one makes two, two and two makes four. Little gradual things. Look at a pixel on a television, a television, modern television screen. It's composed of millions of pixels, right? Tiny little uh, uh, fa individual factors of information and light. And in my case, one or two pixels, or maybe a hundred thousand, would change. But the rest of the picture is the same. And then months or many years later, I'd get more information in and be forced to reassess some other of my old views. And then more. So it's only when you look back after a lifetime that you see the evolution in your own views and how you thought was just one or two little things at a time eventually does amount to a seismic change of perspective but you weren't aware of it because it was a gradual process this is what happened with roger casement and something else he did not go by the stroke of a wand of harry potter's magic wand for, uh, or dumbledore's from being a bad guy to a good guy he did not go from being a british imperialist or a naive twit to a world weary saint and an irish republican and a bitter hater of britain he was both, and he never hated Britain. He was not a hating man. That's like another key point about Casement. But he was an Irish Republican and a loyal servant of the crown at the same time. The secret life he referred to was a loyal servant of the crown who was still a loyal servant of the crown, but was also convinced Ireland had to be free of the crown and who was working on the establishment of the foundations of the Irish Republican movement at the same time. And that is another reason why he had to die because the sense of betrayal among uh, 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 leaders of Britain like Sir Edward Grey, the British foreign secretary who did more than any other individual human being to propel Britain into the catastrophe of World War I had an enormous sense of betrayal 
they felt that uh, uh, he had been stringing them along for, a f for fools and that he was privately laughing at them, which he was not. But when they discovered that he was not who they had taken him for, their hatred and reaction against him was enormous. But who was this man? Where did he come from? What made him so unique? What makes him so elusive when he is at the same time the most open and guileless and in some respects the most innocent of men? Well, as they say, uh, as Mary Poppins rightly says in The Sound of Music, let's, let's start at the beginning. It's a very good place to start. Roger Casement is the son of an idea, a man very much like himself. His father is a baron, uh, uh, is a landowner in County Antrim, Northern Ireland, which is rather like being a landowner in the South after the Civil War. It guarantees that you are going to live in poverty and even worse, in the shame of hiding that poverty for the next 60 or 80 years of your life, because your land is absolutely burnt out and worthless. There is no land more harsh, more hard, more unforgiving, uh, more re uh, reactive against crops and even against grass for sheep to graze on than the, uh, 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 the, ba the basalt rock, uh, uh, rocks of County Antrim. And coming from there myself, I can assure you of that. And therefore, the, the fundamentalist Protestant religion that comes from there is hard and ruthless and genocidal and unforgiving and unforgiving. But Casement is the, and his sister and his brother are raised by two kind, loving parents. His father, who the son takes strikingly after, is an idealist who in 1848 volunteered to fight for another gallant, inevitably losing cause, the Hungarian Democratic Revolution against the Habsburg Empire in 1848, from which he had to run from his life, after, of course, impoverishing himself for life as well. The father dies and breaks, it breaks Casement's heart when he's only nine years old. His mother dies only two or three years later. He is raised by harsh, mean as shit, uh, distant relatives in County Antrim. He is exposed to a harsh uh, corporal punishment school. He leaves school at 16. He, does, he is not an aristocrat. He does not have a silver spoon in his mouth. He has an iron rod metaphorically stuck up his behind. He goes to Liverpool and becomes a clerk, as low as you can be. Rather likes, you know, uh, in the, uh, the, I think it's the Pirates of Penzance, remember? Uh, the first, uh, the Lord of the King's Navy starts off as a clerk and he, you know, polishes the big brass doors. And that's how he becomes the Lord of the King's Navy. Casement starts in a similar way. He's uh, toiling away for years in Liverpool. He moves to London. He becomes a clerk. And then he gets a chance to be a clerk where nobody wants to be a clerk. In West Africa, before there is air conditioning and before there is quinine, and where 90% of English, uh, 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 where no willing English settler grows, goes, and where Eng every English commercial official and government officer who goes there, 90 to 95% of them will be dead within two years from malaria or one of the even worse local, uh, local plagues, right? You don't go to West Africa in the 19th century if you want to live to the age of 30, if you're 28 years old. But there's nowhere else for him to go, so he goes there. And he's hardworking, again, the Ulster Protestant background, work ethic and background, and a high natural intelligence. And he's honest, which is not automatically to be found, as any reader of Dickens knows, in English 19th century, or American, even more 19th century, commercial and business circles. So he, he doesn't climb the ladder dramatically, but he doesn't starve either. He has a career. And eventually, therefore, since nobody else wants to go there, he becomes an expert on West African business. And he gets taken on at first in part-time roles as a stringer, we would say, in journalism in my generation, and eventually works his way into a position which is an enormous come up in the world for him, for the British foreign, uh, uh, colonial office. He doesn't get into the foreign office because the foreign office is prestigious and only for the sons of gentlemen who have been through public schools. Ladies need not apply, of course. 
but only for the sons of gentlemen, for the colonial office, which runs a quarter of the earth and the largest and most disorganized also empire, which was a secret for its flexibility and success uh, that there has ever been. He gets taken on initially in, uh, again, humble and small worlds, but it's in Africa and he's gotten used to being in Africa. And there's another reason I think why he gets used to being in Africa. He grew up in County Antrim. If you grew up in County Antrim, think of growing up in Labrador and not being able to afford coal or logwood for your fires. Right. And that's the way Roger Casement grew up. So after that, Basically, you're immune to too much heat, however immune, uh, humid it is. You will take physical hardships and regard them as a blessing because everything is better than the way you were raised. And the hardships and horrors of Roger Casement's childhood have enormous repercussions and give him two, several enormous advantages in shaping his future life. First, they enable him to work and flourish happily in the tropics when almost none of his contemporaries from England on, uh, or other European colonial nations are ready to do so. So there is always work and demand for him to do. And as he does it, he is accumulating experience, he is accumulating reputation, he is accumulating re expertise. And it takes him slowly, it takes him 20 or so years to do these things, but he's getting them. And secondly, you have been exposed, if you grew up in County Antrim as an orphan, to such abominable hardships and brutalities, especially if you are a sensitive, loving boy who up to the age of nine was surrounded by innocence and love by your loving parents who are cruelly taken from you, not by war or history or government, but by poverty and illness. And this is the, uh, the second aspect of the paradox of Casement, that he is a figure of enormous compassion and sensitivity and empathy with the sufferings of other human beings because he had suffered these things himself. And yet he had suffered so much himself physically that he was also, uh, again, Maureen, bless you. I mean, it, it, uh, uh, neither of us planned it this way, but you raised the concept of the Superman in this, the Nietzschean abomination of the Superman, which Masaryk, rightly filled Masaryk with disgust and horror, as it fills us with disgust and horror. And then I countered, of course, with the she Siegel and Schuster conception of the Superman, the kind, benign, America at its best version of Superman in action comics and the movies that we still rightly celebrate to this day. We don't actually practice it, of course, but at least it's the, uh, it's, uh, the tribute that vice pays to virtue, the recognition that this is an admirable and right way to be. I submit to this group and, and to other viewers that Roger Casement was an anti-Nietzschean Superman. He ultimately gave his life selflessly he lived his entire life selflessly in the service of others. He saved scores of millions of human lives. He showed the whole human race a better way to be, a better way to go, a way without war to end human rights abuses and expose them. And he was personally capable of the most extraordinary acts of physical and moral courage and suffering and endurance in achieving these goals. And we should also add, he had many friends. He was a nice guy. He was fun to be around. He was an extremely shy man, but like many shy people, he took pleasure in the qualities of others. He was a lifelong friend and he impressed the most extraordinary people. Uh, including a wide range from English ultra conservatives, from King George V himself at one end of the political spectrum, to Sidney and Beatrice Webb, the founders of the Fabian movement, and to H.G. Wells, who uh, uh, I, along with Matt, regard as personally a very loathsome figure, but a, a brilliant man, a formidable man, not a man to be ignored, and a titan of vision in the 19th century. And he was also close personal friends with Ireland's greatest poet in its history, as we shall see, William Butler Yeats, a fellow Irish, Irish uh, uh, Protestant, though from the south where Casement was from the north. And uh, over the years, he developed these friendships and coming from the most obscure background and having had to labor in the most obscure 
uh, offices straight out of a Charles Dickens novel in his 20s and early 30s, Casement relished this. He went to the top of the heap. And as we shall see, he was ready to give it all up. And he did because of his passion for justice, because of his passion for justice. Now, as I said before, unfortunately for Casement, he wanted happiness not just for himself, but for other people too. He was an idealist. He looked around the world, and having suffered so much himself, he saw suffering wherever he looked. He saw that however the great the horrors of industrial civilization were in England and Europe, they never, the, uh, the enormous productive potential of steam engine technology opened the way to free the human race for the first time in its history from the drudgery of manual labor. But the peoples in Africa did not have access to this. They did not have the education. They did not have the technological background. They did not have the underlying culture initially. How to give it to them? Casement's first solution is the solution of Ronald Reagan and Bill Clinton and company. It is globalism. It is the power of the free market. He's working in the city of London. These goods are being produced. The profit principle is certainly producing productivity. Goods are being produced more cheaply and on a wider scale than ever before in history of the world. Let's have free trade. What could go wrong? And he believes this until, as we shall see, he sees how it starts to work out in practice. From the 1870s onwards into the 1880s, the young casement, as I say, spends, uh, 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 comes to become an Africa hand. He spends all his time in Africa, but he starts out in West Africa. There is one huge area in Africa where he does not go into, where nobody goes into. Terra incognito. What another great expatriate, an embracer of English literary culture, and also great critic of the English deep state, another genius, Joseph Conrad, right? And Conrad fascinatingly writes about two tremendous themes, which also engage the great John le Carre, the greatest British writer of certainly the second half of the 20th century. I would maintain that Evelyn Waugh is the greatest of all fictional writers in England in the first half of the 20th century that nobody comes close to him and that John le Carre is the greatest fictional writer of the second half of the 20th century in England. And what are le Carre's two great obsessions? They are the oppression of the third world by the money pars in London and New York. And even before that, and also right to the end of his life, the proliferation and takeover of demo democratic life in Britain and else other nations by the deep state. In fact, towards the end of his life, when Le Carre is in his mid-80s, he's walking with a friend along the Thames Embankment in London. And they look at the new headquarters of the British Secret Service, which is also shown uh, and displayed proudly in the James Bond movie Skyfall. And he points to it and he says, the Bastille, the Bastille, that's our Bastille. Now, this is an attitude that anyone in England to this day, Labour Party as well as Conservative, would regard as treason, would regard with shock, would regard with horror, would refuse to believe because they know they're living in the freest, most open, most democratic society and the most generous and warm-hearted society uh, that the world has ever known. And therefore, uh, uh, what better society to pass judgment on the rest of the world? What better society to tell NATO what to do and to pass judgment on the rest of the world? But old John le Carre, who had actually served in the British Secret Service in his youth, as most of the great British novelists of the 20th century did, that's how they came to their dark, deep understanding of human nature. Graham Greene, forget Ian Fleming. Ian Fleming is a ridiculous little child. Who, ne who never grows up, but Malcolm Muggeridge, Graham Greene, Le Carre, and if you let my old aging neurons, uh, 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 Len Dighton, of course, 
Th they all had deep and profound connections with the deep state and others too. So they knew it from the, the as Orwell, George Orwell said, they were inside the belly of the beast. They were inside the whale. They knew the whale from the inside, right? And uh, Conrad, who certainly had his run-ins with British security, is a very dubious uh, 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 Polish exile in Britain, uh, uh, who had friends among the, uh, 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 among the revolutionaries, even though he despised them. But he's a Pole. He's in England. He writes English better than any, any Englishman does. He's smarter than any Englishman. So, of course, he's a security risk. So uh, uh, it is Conrad who pioneers this obsession, first with the oppression, uh, and uh, even uh, Frederick Forsyth, who in, in later life becomes sim a very simple gonko flag waver. But if you look at his early novels, uh, especially The Dogs of War and The uh, Day of the Jackal, they're not like that at all. He had been a British secret agent in France, doubling, as so many of them did, as a reporter for Reuters. And later, uh, 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 if you, you want to look at British, uh, 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 the way uh, the city of London works to destabilize governments around the world, the French do likewise, uh, by setting off coups and using mercenaries to do it. To this day, there's no better primer, primer for you to start with than the dogs of war. The movie with Christopher Walken is an honorable uh, and well worth watching movie. But it's not what you should go to. Uh, as with the Godfather novels by Mario Puzo, you have to go back to the books because there's so much more in Puzo and there's so much more in Forsyth. The texture of what is being done and how it is being done and why it is being done and why a million, three million people, including a million children, were starved to death in Biafra from 1967 to 1970 so that British petroleum could maintain control over the oil resources of Nigeria. All of that is in Forsyth. And all of that is prefigured in what happens in the Congo a hundred years before, uh, and that is uncovered by casement. Because casement, even in business, doesn't, uh, 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 he, he comes to see that business is not working to raise the standards of living of Britain and people in Africa the way he thought it was going to. The people of Africa are being milked dry. There has to be another solution. Fortunately, there is one at hand, the British Empire. Casements joins the British imperial government to protect the poor from the, uh, the rich, to protect the weak from the poor. What could go wrong? Well, at first, a lot of things actually go right. Casement rises there because, again, this is Africa before the age of air conditioning and before the age of quinine and before the age of modern medicine. And you have to be suicidal or insane or a superman like Casement to be white and European and physically survive there. So he's in huge demand. And just as he prospered in his business career, only modestly because he's an honest man and acquiring money is never a priority for him. But he also prospers in the British government. He's hardworking, he writes clear prose, he is reliable, he goes to places nobody else will go to. And on his own initiative, he stopped there. And it is pure curiosity that takes him there at first. Nothing more, nothing more. It is accident that takes him there, not idealism. He hears strange, disquieting stories that everything is not as it ought to be in most of Africa, the enormous chunk of Africa that in, 1880, uh, in 1876 is de facto taken over by the King Leopold of Belgium using a British explorer, Henry Livingston, a very famous British national hero, and British military troops and mercenaries to establish control there. And a decade later, King Leopold's control of Africa is confirmed at the Congress of Berlin by the powers of Europe. Otto von Bismarck confirms that he knows nothing about what's really going on in the Congo because he wants to stay on the right side of the British. And he also wants to distract the Germans very sensibly from competing with the British. Germany is already the number power in Europe. Nobody can compete with its military power, its industrial power. 
The British are the number one power in the sea, and Germany doesn't have a hope Bismarck rightly understands of ever challenging the British at sea, so why bother? Better to get on with the British and divide the world between us. And they do. And one should add for the record that the record of German colonialism in Southwest and Southeast Africa is every bit as merciless and genocidal as the British control of wealthier parts of the continent. The only reason that the Germans don't kill as many people as the British is the British have only let them have the less agreeable parts of Africa, where there are less people to kill in, the fir- in order to clear the grounds in the first place. But uh, before World War I, there was a rising against the German Empire in Southwest Africa. And the colonial governor who becomes a, lo- a national hero in Germany for his role is Goering the father of Hermann Goering, because he exterminates all the native people who are standing in his way. Now, this is long before the Goerings have turned from pure uh, opportunism to exterminating Jews or exterminating Slavs. It's just the way to get rid of inferior races. They've read Nietzsche too. Nietzsche's one of theirs. And of course, Darwin, the great admired English leader, justifies them in this because Darwin says God is dead. Darwin says the British Empire will live forever. Dar- uh, Darwin says that the mechanism of evolution, and uh, uh, I do not like the term evolution. I think it's unscientific and uh, hit, uh, uh, science proves us there is, uh, the mechanism for change is adaptation through DNA, which is three-dimensional, which responds to heat and uh, 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 different environments and to different food inputs that we take. And we see physical characteristics of human beings, whether it's the Irish coming to America or the Japanese coming to Hawaii or the Jews coming from Central Europe to, uh, uh, to the Middle East. Physical characteristics of people that remained ingrained for thousands of years change, not when you change the breeding patterns, but when you change the inputs of environment and and nutrition. And DNA makes sense of this, the way DNA responds to input. So that is why DNA is so successful, because human beings adapt to different environments. And this is enormously important. Which is why, of course, uh, if you uh, if you have people from West Africa or uh, uh, the Caribbean whose parents were functional illiterates coming to America or Britain or Canada and going to basic schools, they're at least as competent as anybody else, and actually always more competent because and I, I've given graduate courses at the accredited universities now in Washington D.C. the pa- the, uh, uh, the benign patterns of migration. The benefits of my great mass immigration, uh, as long as they're sensibly uh, uh, monitored and controlled and do not swamp existing cultures and populations, uh, are enormous and vastly outweigh the negatives such as local ethnic organized crime that, would, regardless of the group, always comes with them, always comes with them. Now, in, uh, here we have the opposite. We have Casement wanting to bring Western Enlightenment to West Africa. The free market is not going to do it. It's only making things worse. He becomes a servant of the crown, and worrying, uh, while working for the crown, they want information on what's going on in the Congo as well. Not because they want to end a genocide. They don't even know or care whether, whether a genocide is going on. Nobody cares. It is being done in silence. It is Casement who does the primary reporting. And not only is he an outstanding investigative reporter and brave reporter going where war correspondents today go, you know, risking his life going to the most inaccessible armpits of hell and creation, but he's a good writer. He can write about it afterwards as well. And you find that with the great war correspondents, whether Harrison Salisbury in World War II, my old boss and mentor Arnold de Borgraf of Newsweek in Vietnam and at the NBN Fu and in Afghanistan in 1978, uh, or, or the late Marie Colvin, who was killed in action in Syria about a, a decade ago, the, great, or the late great Robert Fisk, who was outstanding in the Middle East, and I was privileged to meet a couple of times. He had an extraordinary memory. We meet in 1989, and I want to interview him for an interview which is later suppressed by neocons operating in the Washington Times. Uh, But I like him, and I I interview him. And he knew the interview would be suppressed. I was naive. I was sure it would run. Little did I know, right? But as soon as I come in, Bob looks at me. He looks intensely at me, and he says, wait a moment, let me think. 
Europa Hotel, Belfast, Whip and Saddle Bar, 1975. That was the last time we met, 14 years before, and he covered a couple of major wars in the Middle East in between. I covered a few things too. But, you know, when I was young and starting out, nobody, you don't, you don't forget meeting a man as legendary as Robert Fisk. Who was I? I was nobody. And he still remembered me. Now, this is the kind of man Roger Casement was too. He was a beautiful writer which will, uh, as we continue, turn out to be a very important point in unraveling some of the mysteries of his story as well, as well as his impact. Because, and uh, like the best reporters, he's the opposite of Hemingway. Hemingway never gives you anybody else's point of view. The only great spiritual understanding, sensitive, brave figure who knows how to live and die and die nobly and die well is Hemingway. Everybody else is a ludicrous caricature. The, the, the women are all pains in the neck. He really doesn't like women, but a real man has to you know, master women and beat them, of course. So that's what Hemingway, real man, and does and his, his hero characters do. But the only sensitive figure is always the narrator, Hemingway himself. Casement was not like that. Casement, like Solzhenitsyn, like Dostoevsky, like the truly great novelists, like Dickens or Trollope, or uh, Shakespeare, who is Marlowe, lets his own characters speak for themselves. He interviews people, he translates them, and he tells their stories. Well, first, uh, the, Belgi uh, the Belgian officer cut off my left hand because I wasn't producing enough rubber. And then the, a year later, he cut off my right hand because I wasn't producing enough ivory. And then he killed my, my children in front of me. Casement documents literally thousands of such stories at first hand. He identifies the individuals who gave them to him. And what did I learn? Uh, in, in the hideous newsroom of the Belfast fucking Telegraph, I give, forgive the language, but I took a blood oath only to refer to that outfit in those terms many decades ago. But what do you basic? What's a fundamental of journalism? Who, what, where, when? The basic facts, not just the fact of what happened, where it happened, when it happened, who it happened to, who your eyewitness descriptions are. You don't find this in the New York Times or the Washington Post. You always find, and you find it back in Watergate, character assassination by anonymity. Curiously enough, I find Russian news agencies don't operate this way. They're very old fashioned. They make work harder for you when you work for them. You actually have to identify the individuals you speak to. Plenty of times uh, I, I had to be bored stiff listening to some pompous, self-important, extremely unimportant uh, retired bureaucrat give me endless shit uh, that I didn't need when I wanted one or two key facts I never, or confirmations I never got from him. And then he would say, you can use it all, of course, generously. You know, provided you can use it anonymously. And I'd say to him, this is not an American newspaper. They have higher standards. This is a European outfit. This is German or Russian or French. They have higher standards than you do. They insist on identification. Americans aren't used to that. Aren't used to that. This is used throughout Watergate. When you're dealing with the deep state, you can, you're, you're never going to be free to tell the whole truth, even if you know it. You'll never know it anyway. But you're never going to be free to tell everything you want to tell. And there are different limitations. And there are wonderful people like Cy Hirsch who can stretch those limitations or break through them here, there, and everywhere. And Cy is still doing it at age 86. And Casement did it too. The line from, uh, to Seymour Hirsch from, uh, Seymour Hirsch is a spiritual son of Roger Casement. They both exposed war crimes and the slaughter of women and children by well-armed men and the destruction of the poor at the hands of the powerful and the rich. It's the same principle. It's the same motivation. It's the same drive. It's the same moral force. It's the same moral force. So, Casement also makes another discovery. Remember, Casement has never been a loner, even when he's coming into the most remote parts of the jungle by himself. He's representing organizations. First, he worked for Liverpool and London trading companies. Then he worked for the British government. Uh, 
At first, he works for the British government as a very lowly clerk, and slowly he rises in reputation and in position. And again, slowly, not quickly. Nothing ever came easily to Roger Casement. That's true for all the sons of County Antrim. Again, those, that, that basalt rock and that poor soil. Life is not easy up there. But he gets there. But he's doing so as part of an organization. He has to be uh, earn the trust of superiors. And gradually he earns the trust of more senior superiors. He is a company man, by which I do not mean he mortgages his soul or his uh, character or his integrity to the company. But his career is in, like most of ours, a social environment. He has to interact with other people. And this is extremely important, too, because I've known talented, outstanding reporters, and actually Cy Hirsch is an outstanding example of it, who are wonderful reporters but have never been editors, have never been managers, have never been entrepreneurs, and would not, do not even want to be very often, and usually, but they do not have the temperament for it. And to work successfully in my business in the newsroom is very different from being a foreign correspondent. And I've been both over long periods of time in my career. And at heart, I'm basically a newsroom person, which I still am in my 70s. I like interacting with other people. The Superman myth even comes into this. Because Clark Kent, we find as the story is refined over the past 50 and 60 years, uh, he's no longer the nerd he was when he starts out in the Daily Planet, was originally the Daily Star back in 1938 in Action Comics. Uh, it took them uh, uh, 50 years before they thought he, he couldn't just come from the Midwest. Was there anywhere in the Midwest he actually came from? And you should be proud to know it was a Canadian who located the homeland of Superman. The wonderful artist and writer John Byrne, who I believe and hope is still very much with us today. The man who revitalized the X-Men and the Fantastic Four also revitalized Superman. And it was John Byrne in 1986 who decreed that uh, Jonathan and Martha Kent found the famous little rocket from Krypton with the lovable little baby inside it in the state of Kansas. Superman is a Kansas Chiefs fan, right? Super, uh, 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 Superman loves Patrick Mahomes. Now it can be said, right? He gives some time and place. And the finest of modern writers on Superman, who is now making millions of dollars, I think, and he's actually earned them, I think, a wonderful writer called Jeff Jones, who is now a senior consultant for superhero movies for, for Warners. And unless you work for Disney on their Marvel franchise, there is nothing bigger in, in movies than to make Wonder Woman or Batman movies, right? It's the ultimate. You never get higher, right? My God, you can meet Gal Gadot, you know? You know what is there to do in life beyond that, right? But uh, there is an enormous insight here which applies to Casement and also, again, is an anti-Nietzschean insight. And a few years ago, uh, Jeff John, John, Johns retells in a classic uh, six-part series, The Origin of Superman. And it's the same classic origin. It's just told to make it contemporary with the 21st century instead of the 1930s and the 1950s or the 1980s, right? And there is a scene where little nine-year-old Clark Kent is starting to get superpowers. And he's activated without realizing it in the rocket that came to Earth, which, is, which Jonathan had buried, of course, in, beneath the corn in the Kansas cornfield. And a holograph of his natural father on Krypton comes up. Kal-El, you are the last son of Krypton. You must become a god and leader and savior you know, to this uh, uh, well-meaning but troubled and inferior human race. Heed my wisdom. And this is to a little six, eight or nine-year-old little, little boy. He's saying this, and the little boy is terrified in the comic. This isn't a comic, right? For kids, for, for kids between age nine to 12. And it's a great lesson for them. The little boy runs to the man who could not have physical children of his own, his loving father, Jonathan Kent, the farmer, right? The loving, kindly uh, father and says, daddy, daddy, papa, papa, protect me, protect me. I don't want to be Kal-El. I don't want to be Kal-El. I'm Clark. I'm Clark Kent. I'm your son. I'm your son. Don't let them take me. And in the comic, uh, uh, and this is a key to Casement too. I never thought I'd be bringing so much of Superman into Roger Casement. Roger Casement was a Superman. So hell, why not? Right? 
Jonathan Kent throws his arms around his terrified little son and says to him, Clark, you're always going to be my son. To my mind, that is the most mo moving page and the most moving sentence that has ever been written in 84 years of incredibly popular fiction about Superman, about the most popular fictional American uh, character uh, in history. And you see, when he was a little boy, Roger Casement had those moments. And it gave him a compassion that stayed with him through every persecution, through every suffering, through every disappointment, and every betrayal in his life. But now you see he has a new cause. Working for the British government, he has uncovered an unspeakable crime, a gigantic crime. Thousands of people. And then it turns out to be hundreds of thousands of people. And eventually we discover the figure will be 10 million. A longer period of time with over 30 years, King Leopold of Belgium and the private companies of Belgium using British finance and British mercenaries as well as Flemish Belgian ones have killed as many individual human beings, including women and children and elderly men in Congo as Stalin killed in the purges as were killed in the Russian Civil War, a greater of number of uh, people killed than Jewish people killed in the Holocaust. Hitler did manage to exceed that by killing 20 million Russians in smaller, more obscure concentration camps scattered across uh, Russia that uh, modern scholarship has only uh, uncovered within the past 20 years. And that story is still virtually unknown, even though it has been uncovered and documented by serious mainstream scholars. And again, we come across something I often despair of here, you can fight deliberate cover-ups, but what on earth can you do when the cover-up is not deliberate? When, when the information is not covered up and is in the public domain, but hundreds of millions of people simply are not interested in it. They do not care. They do not want to know. They do not believe it. It is inc it, uh, I mean, uh, I despise Al Gore for an infinite number of reasons not to mention the, uh, uh, his role in the destruction of modern scientific technology. But let us at least give him credit for one thing. He came up with a very useful phrase, the inconvenient fact. History and the history of genocide and human rights abuses are full of inconvenient facts, facts that do not have to be repressed or suppressed or denied because people simply don't want to entertain the possibility that something so horrible and unpleasant could have happened in the first place, especially that we did it and not them, whoever they are. And this is what Casement has uncovered. And Casement is still a true believer at this point in the 1880s and 1890s, but how to get in the British Empire, but how to get the story out. Because the first problem he finds is the British colonial office and power office are not interested in, in civil human rights. Well, up to the 20th century, uh, 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 the, the US Department of State and the Foreign Office in London were not interested in the Holocaust either. The Turkish Foreign Office, Muslim nation in the Middle East, rescues more Jews from Europe than Britain and, Fran uh, Britain and America during World War II together combined. <laughs> and Turkey was a poor in those days. Now it's very heavily industrialized, but in those days it was an unindustrialized, very impoverished nation that could not afford to defy the British Empire. And in fact, the Turkish foreign ministry, and this is all in my upcoming book, the book is written again. If anyone can help me get a publisher for it, please do, I need one. I need a publish. Uh, uh, Bruce knows the story. He's done uh, work, uh, 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 tried to move mountains and been heroic on my behalf. That didn't work out for no uh, for no fault of his. But I still need a publisher. But here we find the Turkish Foreign Office comes up with a rescue plan to save half a million Jewish lives from Hitler in the Balkans alone in World War II, and they are not allowed to do it. 
It is the British and American governments that prevent them doing it, primarily the British government, which pushes the American government in the same direction. Eventually, the American government gets a much better record once Franklin Roosevelt, and it's very late in the day, but he finally intervenes and he gives his Secretary of the Treasury, Henry Morgenthau, executive authority in January 1944 to finance and mount rescue operations for Jews and other threatened nationalities in Eastern Europe. And they, uh, uh, they, they, they set up a new uh, small sub-organization within, ironically, the Treasury Department, because the State Department cannot be trusted to run it, because they have spent the last 10 years keeping Jews and gypsies and Slavs out of America, to keep, uh, and uh, Italians too, incidentally, and Spanish, to keep America wasp pure. Absolutely wasp pure. And they're all Darwinians, incidentally, as well. They're all very devoted Darwinians. You see how different strands of what you know and what you have studied and what you have taught me come together in huge issues like this. Now, I don't even know if Roger Casement was a Darwinian. I think not. He was a devout Christian, and as we shall see, became more devout rather than less as his life became ever more complicated and threatened. But he, uh, he believed in very fundamental Christian values, and he did not believe in very fundamental Darwinian values, just the extermination of the weak at the hands of the strong, and that this is always justified, at least so long as Britain is strong. He did not believe in that. Now, Casement starts circulating his concerns about human rights abuses in the 1890s, and then at the turn of the century in London, and very slowly, nothing ever happened fast for Roger Casement, he starts to make influential friends. He is, as I said before, he has the gifts of a natural writer. He's been writing, well, first commercial, it's natural to him. He writes commercial reports, then he becomes a bureaucrat, but he does not write as a bureaucrat. He loves to read literature. And he becomes friends with some of the leading literary figures in England and Ireland of his generation. And he makes 20 years friendships that last as long as he lives with friends who are loyal to him after he dies, even after he's been falsely accused of treason and even worse things. These are people who know the real Roger Casement and think the world of him. One of them is, is, is the greatest stylist of turn of the century English literature, the Polish emigre, again, who I mentioned before, the great Joseph Conrad. And as a result, Casement becomes an effective writer and he makes friends. One of his friends is Wickham Steed, who is uh, an investigative reporter who produces the equivalent of the National Enquirer of the day or the New York Post, the Paul Mall Gazette, a supposed quality British newspaper, which nevertheless thrives on horrific and sensational exposés of terrible human rights abuses. Most of all, Wickham Steed exposes the Victorian mania for having sex with little girls below, and boys, but especially girls, below the age of nine. Below the age of nine. And there are special uh, brothels all across Victorian London that specialize in this particular expertise, quote unquote. And Wickham Steeds buys a girl from them and then reports it in the, uh, in the Paul Mull Gazette just to show that these things are actually happening in London. Because of course, nobody can raise this in Parliament because we're the most, not just we're a Christian nation, we are the most Christian and moral nation that has ever existed in the history of the world. Is this starting to sound, have a familiar ring to it today? So being the most moral and Christian nation that has ever existed in the history of the world, it is not possible that such things could be happening in our capital city, not 10 miles from Buckingham Palace. But they're happening all right. And what is the response of the British legal and political system to Wickham Steele's revelation? Why, of course, they arrest him and prosecute him for buying a minor, even though he had set the girl free immediately. I can tell you a first-hand story from a personal friend of mine to this day. You might want to get him to talk to this group. I think he'd be willing to. A TNT radio correspondent, a colleague of yours, of course, Bruce, and I think you know, you know certainly of him very well, the great John Kiriakou. John Kiriakou was a CIA officer. 
And like Roger Casement, he was a patriot who believed in the cause until he found the cause was totally corrupt. And his moment of revelation was he, uh, he is the only man who was ever uh, jailed for the epidemic of torture that was carried out by the, the George W. Bush Jr. administration and the CIA under its auspices for, uh, around the entire world in the so-called GWAT, Global War uh, on Terrorism. And why was he the only man to be jailed in the Global War on Terrorism for torture? Because he was a torturer? No, of course not. The opposite. Because John exposed the torture. He was the whistleblower. And for that, he had to spend three years in Leavenworth jail. His wife left him to raise their five kids by himself, which he, against all the odds, being the kind of man he, he is, continued to do so. And then he found he was unemployable across America, the land of the free, the land of dissent, the land of, uh, uh, of, of brave and the fearless. And so he had to go to work for the Russians to do honorable, honest, open work for them as a journal, radio journalist, which as far as I know, he is still doing. But no one else would hire him, would they? No one else would hire them. And why? Because he was a modern heir of Roger Casement. Thank God we still find them. We find them everywhere. Roger Casement had no physical sons as far as we know. But his spiritual sons, thank God, keep popping up all over the place, even in the CIA, even in the CIA. So there is hope yet. Casement is making these friends in the 1890s. But how to get the word out? Because Britain's free and fair tabloid press, which is revered throughout the world as the most free and independent media, press media the world has ever known, Yet nothing, not even the penny dreadfuls that are printed on ink that comes off in your hand. Nobody will touch the story. Nobody will touch the story. But eventually they start getting out the story in some outlets in America and in continental Europe. And he and his colleagues, in particular, an idealistic journalist called Morel and Wickham Steed, who will later actually die on the Titanic the inadvertent victim of British stupidity as opposed to British malevolence. But you could say there is a fitting irony to that, a tragic fitting irony to that, a man who deserved so much better. But they start getting the story out and word goes around. And what you found, there's an excellent book on this by a very fine writer called Adam Hockhoff. I'm sure I mispronounce his name. It is called King Leopold's Ghost. And uh, again, uh, Hochwith, in the introduction Hoch to this child. Book, Hoch Hoch child. Thank you. Uh, Magdalene, would you mind spelling that out, not just for me, but of course for everybody here? H O C H C H I L T. Hoch child, thank you. Yeah. If I remember correctly, and I stand to be correct, as you can see, it's been quite a while since I read the book, and I didn't even refresh myself with it before coming to this lecture. But if I recall, Mr. H Hochschild even says he stumbled into the story, he was looking for other stuff, and he was surprised by the sensitivity to this day of the Belgian government and what remains of its archives on certain unfortunate issues that happened 150 years ago. Why should this be? And then he starts digging into it. And he gives credit, rightly, not just to Casement, but to Morel and Steed and to this very tiny handful of their friends who are working with them. And again, I'm always inspired or sidetracked, uh, as you know, to pull in uh, parallels that unexpectedly occur to me here. The number of people who expose this genocide uh, the handful of heroes, there were less than 10 of them who did the real work. And they're all documented in the Hook Child's great book, right? And but without question, Casement is the moral driving force and the central hero and, and the closest thing to a leader that they have. He's not the guy who does the most to get the story out, because that was the journalists among them themselves. They understood the, med the new global mass media that was coming into existence and how to find the loopholes in it and how to present the stories to maximum effect. But they were a team and they were friends and they all worked together on this. And again, you see parallels from this pop out in uh, later and modern times too. 
But what K. Smith is actually doing here in the first decade with his friends in the 20th century is doing something that has never been done before and has been done far too seldom since, but they are pioneering it and they are doing the prototype. They are showing how the new global international mass media can be used, how the, the, the best things in a global society can be used to fight and expose the worst crimes and excesses and criminalities of a global society. They are showing how to use the mass media to expose human rights abuses and war crimes and crimes against humanity. During World War II, both the British and the American, I mean, it's interesting. There's a, a moment in World War II, in 1942, the British House of Commons condemns the war crimes of, of the Nazis against the Jews. They know it's a genocide. They know the Nazis are to kill all the Jews. The, prime, the foreign minister, Anthony Eaton, says so in the House of Commons. Other ministers say so. Members of parliament of both the ruling parties, Labour and Conservative, get up and say so. They make the vote. A leading member of the parliament, one of the most respected figures in it, the veteran diplomat Sir Harold Nicholson, writes in his diary proudly that night, and Nicholson is a good man and a sincere man. And what does he write? We have put the Nazis on notice that we will hold them accountable for what they are doing to the Russians and to the Jewish people and to the Poles, that there will be an accounting. And he thinks that's all you have to do. He isn't being a hypocrite. He doesn't want the Poles and the Russians and the Jews to suffer. He's simply an innocent. He has no conception that you're dealing with an entire society of genocidal fucking maniacs. And you have to literally bomb them flat or use the Red Army to flatten them to stop the killing. To stop the killing. Until it is actually physically stopped and they're all killed, the killing will not stop. Wow. Wow. Now, in the days of nuclear weapons, that is not always wise or practical to attempt to do. It can end up with everybody on every side being burned to a crisp and probably will sooner rather than later. But it's a start. But they hadn't even reached that start in 1942. They knew what the Nazis were doing. They didn't want to keep it a secret. They exposed it to the world. They knew it was wrong. They thought, but they were old-fashioned 19th century liberal innocents. They thought all you had to do was pass a vote in Parliament, and that would be that. Well, it wasn't quite that easy. It wasn't quite that easy. But in the 19th century, early 20th century, Belgium is a tiny country, and Belgium is dependent on Britain for its physical protection and independence against both France and Germany. They have to keep the British public sweet. Britain is not a full democracy, no nation ever is, but it pretends to be, and the British government cannot ignore totally public opinion in Britain. And also they cannot ignore public opinion in America, which is freer than Britain is at that time, despite all the efforts of Wall Street to the contrary. And uh, Wickham Steed and uh, Roger Casement and their friends are starting to get the story out in America. You, just quick, uh, Marty, I'm so sorry. Um, are, are you referring to W.T. Steed or Henry Wickham Steed? Because they're two separate Steeds. Oh, very definitely. W.T. Steed. Thank you for, for the point. I was only thinking of him. Okay, you're only thinking... Okay. Yes. All right. Uh, 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 just, just as a clarifier, uh, 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 I leave you to make all other connections, with, uh, cor uh, clarifications which are necessary either now or... Uh, uh, yeah, no, sorry. I, I just asked because because the other Steve no, you, Henry Wickham also so ran the New York uh, the New York Times too, and or the London Times, and so there was they're both big newspaper influencers. So okay, exactly, be. exactly. But uh, 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 having said that, over, overlaps and even positive as well as negative ones do happen here. So the story finally comes out, and I'm sorry, I'm probably going on far too long as already, already on this. So I, 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 I key parts of the story at, at an accelerated rate. At least I'll try to get through. As a result, the genocide has ended. King Leopold has to abdicate. Uh, there is an enormous burning of the archive of the government archives in Belgium in 1908 
because they contain enormous details carried out with the cool knowledge of the democratically elected government of Belgium, what the private government of Congo under the king personally was doing to slaughter literally millions and millions of people. The papers are burned for more than a week. There is an enormous bonfire of the vanities, if you, uh, no, rather bonfire of the records of evil crimes that goes on there. And this is allowed to be done. Meanwhile, the global demand for rubber, which has driven all these excesses, is unabated. And a uh, 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 casement now finds he actually has support within the British Empire. He has support within the Foreign Office. He has enemies in the city of London who will ultimately prove fatal to him. But he also has friends. And his friends have been sensitized by the disgusting horrors he releases. And now robber is coming from the Amazon jungle. From the Amazon jungle in Western Brazil, but most especially in Eastern Peru, due east of the Andes Mountains, down in the Andes Basin. And the Aymara native peoples are being used uh, uh, to tap it by their own overseers who are ultimately working for, for huge Peruvian companies that control the government rather than the other way around, which in turn, those companies are financed and run by our old friends and the, the bankers in the city of London. Could similar problems be happening there too? Casement is sent out as a supposed, he's supposedly being demoted, but he welcomes the move because he knows what it's really for. His friends engineer a transfer to him to Manaus to be a regional consul in the middle of Brazil. Now, Brazil is a Portuguese nation. It has an enormous interior of native peoples. Although abuses are being committed, they are not being committed on an enormous scale relative to what's going on in other parts of the world. Portugal is an ally of Britain. Manaus is more than uh, 1,500 miles away. No, I think it's about 2,000 miles away. Brazil is enormous from, uh, from Rio de Janeiro and uh, 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 from the other great cities of Brazil. So it appears to be an enormous humiliation that this troublemaker casement has been sent to, uh, you know, to another armpit in the middle of nowhere. And also, it's a tropical hellhole. Nobody else wants to go there. He knows he, everyone knows he can survive in those circumstances. Let him be harmless there. But of course, Roger Casement is never harmless. He uses his base at Manaus to investigate the treatment of the Amaro Indians across the border in Peru. And what does he discover? The second genocide of his career is going on on a smaller scale, of course. There's less people in, in the Western Amazon jungle than there were across the entire heart of continental Africa. But there's still hundreds of thousands of people being enslaved, tens of thousands of them being slaughtered, being raped, being murdered and disposed of after being raped, having their hands cut off and their eyes gouged out. All the usual tools of big business in 19th century European colonialism in, that, in the third, in, in what was, of course, the developing world. And he exposes this too. And again, partly uh, as it happens, it is in the imperial interests of Britain this time for him to do so. Because the British have stolen robber trees from Brazil and successfully replanted them in Malaya, where they are at least forced to pay Chinese laborers a subhuman wage, as opposed to just exterminating them or cutting their hands off. This is progress in 19th and early 20th century colonialism. You're allowing people to starve slowly rather than exterminating them as slaves when they extract their rubber for you. But Britain now wants to have a global monopoly on the rubber. So it's in the British economic interest of the city of London too, to have the rubber trade from, uh, from Brazil and most of all from Peru shut down. So the massive diplomatic power of the British Empire, this time is actually deployed actively on Caseman's behalf. And the rubber trade of the Aymara incident in Indians was shut down. And once again, more than before, uh, Casement becomes an international hero. And King George V, who was certainly an idiot and a hypocrite, but occasionally unexpectedly had his heart in the right place, not always, not usually, but occasionally, 
admires Casement and personally makes him a knight of the realm so he becomes Sir Roger Casement. All this for an impoverished boy from uh, uh, from uh, uh, almost uh, who had been an orphan, uh, of shame, uh, 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 a impoverished, shameful subgentry in County Antrim in Northern Ireland, in uh, in the most poorest part and uh, uh, with the worst soil in Ireland. And he came up from that, and he never went to university, he never went to college, he had to leave school as a teenager, and now he's knight of the realm and a friend of the king and a global hero for ending two international genocides, two, two global genocides. Wow. But unfortunately, of course, per casement could not stop there for two reasons. First of all, he has also become convinced during his years, especially coming back to Britain and traveling in both England and Ireland, that the suffering of the Irish people, which in these days is now primarily economic, and the poverty in Ireland, right back, even my father remembered it as a boy and suffered from it as a boy into the 1920s and 30s, was abominably bad. And Casement looks on this too with horror, and he is, after all, Irish. And he comes to the conclusion, based not on that, but on the way he has seen British imperial interests and British commercial interests interact in both Africa and South America, that big business is at the heart of all of this. And he becomes convinced that on Ireland, the people of Ireland can only be happy and if they are free, if they are free of England. And so he becomes an idealistic revolutionary and working in secret, he hits itself up the IRB, not the Irish Republican Army yet, the Irish Republican Brotherhood. And he helps develop it with, a, this proves to be of crucial importance, an American wing. Because millions of Irish fled to America, from two million Irish fled to America and survived the trip after the great famine of 18, 45 to 48. And they bred like rabbits afterwards. Even when they're still miserably poor, the Irish look after each other. And the Irish do, uh, they could not do worse than they had done in Ireland, being starved by the British for so long. But by 1910, there are at least 10 million people of Irish background in America. Their Irish identity and culture is still very strong. They have already, uh, they already dominate the police forces and the political machines that control the major Eastern cities. They have not yet moved to national power. They have not yet moved to the Senate or the judicial bench or to federal power or the federal government but they cannot be ignored in presidential or national elections. And Casement is one of the earliest people to see this and to encourage this development, as does a man who admires him enormously, who will shape Irish politics and destiny incredibly and single-handedly into the 1970s. Eamon de Valera last major survivor of the 1916 Easter Rising and future longtime Prime Minister and President of Ireland. He will come, and this is the key to, uh, strategic key to Ireland winning its freedom. And, but before that, it is also the key to the martyrdom of, and, and mur judicial murder of Roger Casement. Now we move forward. Uh, 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 so a Casement now, in the decade before World War I, is living a secret life. His secret life as being an Irish revolutionary intellectual. At the same time, he is a servant of the British government and being acclaimed as Britain's greatest human rights hero for ending two global genocides. Now, for Casement, these are both expressions of his soul, of his desperate need to end needless suffering and exploitation of human beings by other human beings. So there is no split or hypocrisy in Casement's value system or his Christian soul. None. But he must keep half of his life in secret and does so. And what he's doing is so obscure that it appears to be totally unknown at the time to the British government and to his own masters in the foreign office what he is doing. The man who exposes Roger Casement's double game is Roger Casement himself. He, he has retired by now from uh, working in the Foreign Office. World War I breaks out in 1914. Up to that point, the British people were largely supportive of the German people. If you look at British popular 
military fiction and th spy fiction and criminal fiction before 1914, there is one universal arch enemy, France, evil France. It is always evil France that is going to provide the Antichrist. It is France that is going to snuff out Protestantism, that reintroduced the Inquisition to Britain. It is France that is going to exterminate the English people. And just as there was a Napoleon III, who was actually an ally of Britain in raping the West of the world in the 1840s or 50s, but in British popular fiction, of course, he's an arch enemy. This was the opposite of the truth. But up to 1914, the British public do not hate or fear the Germans at all. It's the French they hate and fear. And all of a sudden in 1914, you're at war with Germany. And it's like the American people being told in 1946, 47, don't hate the Germans anymore. Sure, they may have exterminated 6 million Jews, but it was all a mistake and it was just the Nazis anyway. They're all the good guys. No, 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 it's the big bad evil Russians you've got to fear and hate. And we've got to rebuild the German army to use against the Russians. Yeah, right? And everybody buys this reversal of fortune in 1946, 48, just as the British public does in 1914. They are told by uh, Lord Northcliffe, the publisher of the London Daily Mail newspaper, still alas with us to this day, currently pushing for war with Russia. Uh, you know, all in the name of the Ukrainian people, of course, at the same time they are sending, they've already sent half a million Ukrainian boys to needless deaths in the last year because that they were naive enough to follow their American and British military advisors and believe that they knew what they were talking about. Bad mistake, boys. That's the, re the reason I'm not optimistic about the Israelis' chances against Hezbollah and Syria either. It's, it's because the Israelis used to have one of the most formidable armies in history, man for man. But they've been listening to us for too long, and American generals cannot win wars. We can knock over countries, we can occupy them in the blink of an eye, but then we don't know what to do with them afterwards. We have to get out after spent wasting trillions of dollars in them and setting up totally corrupt regimes, uh, you know, uh, uh, and forcing them to buy our, our, our hard drugs and, and, and what have you. According to, well, I'm digressing here, but according to official State Department documents, every country that the United States has militarily intervened on from Vietnam onwards, while we were there and in the years that we left, had higher levels of prostitution, higher levels of drug abuse, higher levels of drug trading or drug production, higher levels of organized crime, lower standards of living, more orphans, higher levels of sexually transmitted diseases by factors of two to 20 than they ever had before we intervened on their behalf to liberate them. What does liberation mean? How do you define it? To use a phrase of that awful idiot, uh, Donald Rumsfeld, our Secretary of Defense for six years, what are the uh, uh, metrics? What are the metrics of this? Well, he, of course, always chose the wrong metrics, but the government of the United States itself measures its own metrics and by its own metrics is found wanting. But we find this paradox back in 1914. The free and fair liberal press of Britain automatically, as to a man, shouts on, uh, you know, kill the Germans. It's a mass European lunacy. There are literally only half a dozen individuals from America all the way to Russia who speak out against this lunacy. And it's fascinating because they come from, you cannot limit them to a particular political division. They are not just of the right or the left. They are not just secular. They are secular and religious hating. They are socialist, but they are also Catholic, Orthodox Christian, Protestant Christian, Jewish secular, devout. But they're individuals. Who are these individual heroes? Albert Einstein, Pope Benedict in Rome, Count Witte, in uh, uh, the finance minister of Tsarist Russia, big, bad, evil Russia, Vita Rasputin, uh, 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 who, cer who certainly liked to sleep from the ladies, but uh, uh, only with consulting adults, as far as I can tell. And he tries to prevent Russia being drawn into the madness of World War I. 
the great socialist leader, Rosa Luxemburg. Of all people in Britain, and I would never have expected this, but it's there, Bertrand Russell, a conscientious objector who goes to jail and is beaten in jail in Britain and does hard labor because he refuses to publicly support and insists on publicly condemning the madness of being involved in World War I over nothing. And a very interesting figure in America who the Darwinists hate as a hick, as a, by their standards, a non-scientific idiot. In other words, a devout Bible-believing Christian, William Jennings Bryan who was Secretary of State at the time, and who really saves two million American lives because had it not been for Brian, Woodrow Wilson would almost certainly have allowed us to go into World War I by 1915. And although uh, 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 he resigns as Secretary of State after the sinking of Lusitania, uh, when he believes Wilson goes far too close to risking war and he recognizes Wilson will eventually propel the United States into this unnecessary, disastrous, ruinous war. Brian resigns on principle. When did you last hear of an American politician resigning from anything on principle? But Brian does it. And as a result, a movie is made worth watching for all the opposite reasons. Anyone ever see them? Uh, oh, Inherit the Wind. It's a lie. It's a liberal, secular fucking lie. It makes he Darrow, the prosecution uh, uh, champion, who is an, uh, and, and the Darwinists, who at the same time are practicing eugen eugenics and the, uh, and, and, the uh, 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 and the Tuskegee experiments of infecting young black children and black teenage boys with syphilis to see what will happen and who are advocating the extermination of all mentally deficient children in uh, American hospitals. The champions of this and who also are opposed to allowing not just Jews, but also Russians and Poles and Eastern Europeans and Italians and Greeks and Spanish into America because they are not of pure white blood. In other words, Protestant blood. These are the heroes in Inherit the Wind. And the Christian champion in real life who opposed all these monstrous policies, William Jennings Bryan, is portrayed as a contemptible buffoon. It's all lies. And it's worth watching just to see the lie in action, knowing it is a lie. Knowing it is a lie. Well, another figure who recognizes this is Casement. Now, remember, Casement by 1914 has been working with the American and British mass media for 20, 25 years. He knows most of it is nonsense. He knows most of it is put, put out by morons. There is a great 1930s short poem by Hiller Belloc, wonderful uh, satirist of the day. One cannot bribe or turn or twist. Thank God, the British journalist. Why not? For seeing what the man, a woman, for seeing what the man will do unbribed, there's no occasion to. Belloc is saying the English journalist is such a drunken, stupid, incompetent idiot, you can get them to swallow anything. And the literary expression of this is one of my favorite comic novels of the 20th century, Scoop by Evelyn Waugh. It's only 150 pages long. I, I doubt any of today's illiterates go into it, but 40 years ago when I was getting into the business, every great foreign correspondent I knew didn't matter if they were Belgian or German or Russian or Canadian or English or, or French or, 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 or Syrian or American or Japanese, they loved Scoop. And you should all read it and you will then understand why. You will then understand why. Lord Copper, the, the publisher of the Daily Beast newspaper in Scoop, right? The, uh, and uh, remember, uh, uh, this is what happens in 1914. The British popular press turns on time. Lord Copper is based on Lord Beaverbrook, who actually was British Minister of Propaganda in World War I and British Minister of Earth Production in World War II, Winston Churchill's closest friend for 50 years, or one of them, one of the very closest, for half a century. And who was also, I regret to tell you, he was Canadian by origin, though he did not stay in Canada. You're obviously all too moderate and too decent for him, right? But he is also one of the architects all his life into the 1960s. He only dies in 1964 of the vilification of Roger Casement. 
1914, the Daily Express is not the only by any means, nor even the biggest, but it is another enthusiastic propaganda banger for war with Germany immediately as much as possible. Now, this is not done uh, for, uh, to aid the Rothschilds. The Rothschilds lose half their value in, when World War I begins. They later recoup it more than recoup it afterwards. Because yes, of course, they're the Rothschilds. They have the connections. If you have lots of money, you can still uh, lose a couple of hundred billion dollars and you have a couple of hundred billion dollars left to recoup it afterwards. It's not such a bad big thing, right? But it is not done to aid the bankers conventionally. It is done to aid the city of London and the British commercial interests. And Casement knows this, and he sees the machines working in action. And then he sees a flood of bizarre uh, uh, stories coming out of the, the German occupation of Belgium. Now, the irony is, if it had been talking about the German occupation of Poland and Russia and the extermination of the Jews in World War II, all the stories would have been true then. Mass extermination of women and children, torture on a gigantic scale. And remember, Casement is the world expert on real-life atrocities. He's exposed these on a genocidal scale twice already in Africa and South America. He smells a rat. He goes to Belgium, which is neutral, from an American base. He investigates the allegations in the British papers that the Germany, Germans are behaving worse than beasts. Now, as I said, here's the irony. In World War II, radicalized by Hitler, they do want to uh, behave worse than beasts. But in World War I, there are civilized people in a civilized army. When they eventually marched east in World War I, Poles and Jews and Ukrainians and Baltic peoples and even Russians all eagerly welcomed occupation by the German army because they knew they were decent and would feed them and protect them. German soldiers had the same reputation, uh, genuine reputation in Poland and Russia and Belarus and Ukraine in World War I that American GIs did in occupied Japan and Germany in World War II. Personally, they were sweet, they were kind, they were gentle, they were good natured, they were generous, they were good guys. They always gave chocolate and sweets to the local kids on a large scale. World War II, again, was a different story. But this was the reality of the German army in Europe in World War I. And Casement discovers this. He discovers there is not a word of truth to any of the British propaganda stories. Sure, Nurse Edith Cavill is executed by the Germans as a British spy, because she was a British spy. She was a patriotic and brave lady, and she paid the price for it. And she was an admirable human being. She was a heroine for her own country. But that was not a human rights abuse, though it was presented as such, of course. He exposes this. And since the British already are desperate to bring America into the war as their only hope for eventually winning World War I, preferably with American blood rather than their own, what Casement is now doing, they see as treason. They see as unforgivable. Casement is exposing the truth, but it is seen as treason. He goes to Germany. Remember, he's an Irish Republican idealist too. He look, explores the possibility of Germany sending military forces to liberate Ireland from uh, Britain. The Irish Republican Brotherhood, which he has helped set up, supports this move. And a rising is planned in 1916. But Casement loses faith in the possibility of a rising because just as he got to know the British government and the city of London too well and knew what, what they were really like, he gets to study the German government in Berlin and sees what it is really like. And he doesn't like what he sees. And he realizes that these people don't give a damn for the Irish people or human rights values or Irish independence. They only want to take over from the British as the lords of the world. That's all they want to do. Right. And therefore, if a rising happening is in Ireland, first, the Germans won't give a damn. Secondly, they won't bother sending any troops or support worth the name to it. So you are going to be getting all these idealistic, brave, fearless young Irish boys in their teens and early 20s to rise in rebellion against the ruthless, merciless British Empire for nothing. So Casement plays another double game that eventually backfires on him. He accepts a ride on a German submarine back to Ireland. But his intention is not to set off the Easter Rising. It is to prevent it. 
But the Irish Republican Brotherhood he has helped create has other ideas. Patrick Pierce and the other leaders of the IRB in uh, Ireland are mystical poets and idealists. And therefore, they have no hesitation in being ready to kill people. They believe in the blood sacrifice. They believe that if they can get the English to massacre a few thousand of the most idealistic boys and young men in Ireland, especially at Easter time, at the season of the crucifixion of the Christ, they will identify Irish republicanism with the sacrifice of Christ forever, and that the Irish Republican Christ crucified on his cross will set off such a national reaction that the English will be driven out of Ireland. And you know what? They are right. They understand their own people. That is exactly what happens. But you see what this means is that the Irish Republican leadership in Ireland in early 1916 is determined to go ahead with the rising. And it knows the rising will fail and be crushed and its leaders will be shot and burned and hanged. And it wants this to happen to create the martyrs it needs to get rid of the English. But Roger Casement stands in their way. So what do they do? As a matter of record, they notify the British authorities where Casement has landed in the west of Ireland and where he's being protected by sympathizers. And it is the IRB that gives the British government and police the information to arrest Casement before the rising actually begins. And then the scenario works out. And the English overreact mercilessly because that's what the British imperialists really did, buying their sweet, mild, polite, smiling gaze. They hang and they burn and they exterminate the innocent with the guilty and often miss the guilty. They made one mistake. They were fearful of the American reaction. And one of the, uh, uh, all the leaders of the rising in Dublin are all hanged, often in conditions of the greatest brutality. James Connolly, the great socialist leader, the great champion of women's rights in Ireland and around the world, uh, an enlightened figure more than 100 years ahead of his time, has been shot and injured defending his position he, and given no medical treatment. He is a dying man already. They strip him up against the post and shoot him down anyway. And this is what they do to the other leaders of, uh, of, of, the, of the rising of Kil Kilmanheim jail. Casement is much more dangerous. He's been a global hero. He must be discredited. He's as dangerous as a nuclear weapon uh, that hasn't been defused. So how do they defuse him? First, they take him back to a safe house. They stick him in the Tower of London himself in London under maximum guard. And secondly, they forge a set of secret diaries in which Casement claims of boasting of uh, raping an endless and abusing an endless number of teenage boys and small boys below the age of puberty. They are known as the Black Diaries. Now, the Black Diaries are created with some skill because they, they have seized all of Casement's private papers. And the, the Black Diaries even fool several of Casement's friends because they refer to obscure locations and people and individuals and places in the most remote parts of the Congo and Peru where Casement had been that nobody except Casement could possibly have known about. And it never occurs to any of these fucking geniuses, even Nobel Prize winners for literature, who read these diaries and solemnly say, well, only Casement must have known, could have known this, so they must be genuine. It never occurs to them that the British government could have forged this st stuff. But there is another classic horrific modern forgery by a deep state secret service, which is never compared with the Casement Diaries and is the key to the whole mystery. And you could say that the Casement Diaries throws important light on it too. Only a decade before. Notice it's the beginning of the 20th century when these things happen, first in Russia, then in Britain, the two greatest empires in the world, both of them with enormous secret places and deep states, right? And in both cases, they're developing a technology of lies, of propaganda, of forgery and deception and mass manipulation of the public 
that has never been conceived of before. And they learn from each other. First, the Russians, but there's also limits to their creativity, therefore they have to steal and beg and borrow and lie. One of the most many fascinating things I have learned from your seminars over the years is Cynthia explaining how Newton stole the, the concept of the calculus from Leibniz, Gotthard Leibniz. And to this day, as we all know, in every American and British textbook and most of the others in Anglo-American dominated science across the world, you are taught that it is Newton who is the great genius who invents uh, uh, calculus. It's never, uh, never uh, uh, whereas what he comes up with by himself is a Rube Goldfarb uh, embarrassing concoction. It's a, it's, it's a cheap ripoff and a very bad one at that. It's like the Smithsonian idiots trying to copy uh, the Wright brothers' machine and then claim that they were the first to flight, which, uh, which they did. Another lie, right? We, we, should, we should have a lecture sometime, and I happily give it, on lies the Smithsonian pushed out that the Wright brothers were not the first in the air, that America was first to the North Pole, that America was first to the South Pole. Lies, 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 that there was no great Native American civilization across North America before the superior white man came. Lies, 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 and put out with the full authority of the American government for 150 years. Right? This is another lie, right? This is, uh, uh, we are dealing again with a big lie. Two big lies. First, uh, the Tsarist government wants to blame the, the Jews for the revolutionary upheaval sweeping Russia. There are Jews in it, but only as a side effect of the wider effect. But the uh, uh, anti-Semitism is very common in Russia and Ukraine. So if you can blame the Jews to, as the revolutionaries, when it backfires on them, because it drives more Jews to support the revolutionary causes. But what do they do? They produce the protocols of the elders of Zion. Now, as Matt knows, there was a TNT radio host, who I now understand has been terminated from it, who believed and still believed in this evil shit. He didn't dare put it out on TNT. TNT is an admirable station. I'm proud to have been associated with and still, do, uh, still am. Uh, please bring that word back to everybody else, Bruce. But... Uh, this particular individual, uh, uh, when, when they discovered what was going on, and for other reasons I, I'm not privy to, they terminated the son of a bitch, and rightly so, rightly so. Because it, it's a pack of lies, and the great historian Norman Cohn wrote a book called Warrant for Genocide, showing how the protocols of the elders of Zion was used by Hitler and the Nazis as supposedly a truthful document to justify the, the, uh, the, the genocide of the Jews in World War II. But where did it come from? It was a forgery created by the Ochrana, the Russian secret police in 1905, 1906, very specifically then. But they didn't have any good or convincing writers. They didn't have the creativity to invent this. So what did they do? They stole it from an earlier document. 40 years earlier, they found an obscure document, a satire written against the French emperor Napoleon III by a liberal Democrat, a decent man, and Paris making fun of Napoleon III as trying to conquer the world and saying that as part of his plot, they built the Paris Metro because they planned to dynamite the, the Paris Metro to collapse the city of Paris in a few months. And this weird stuff is still in the Protocols of the Elders of Zion for, when it's published 40 years later. They couldn't even write their own lies. They had to steal their lies from a totally different document 40 years before, right? This is exactly what happens with the notorious black diaries of Roger Casement, in which he supposed his handwriting is, is copied and forged uh, 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 by and large quite efficiently. Uh, uh, in which, you know, he supposedly boasts of, uh, 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 ra uh, of ra uh, raping and ravishing all these endless little boys. First, the style of, of the document is totally alien to anything Casement ever wrote. But it actually is an exact echo and copy of a diary of, of, of a sexual pervert and child molester, which we do have. He was the Peruvian billionaire who ran uh, the, the, the slave trade uh, in enslaving the Amara people that Casement had exposed 10, year, 10 and 12 years before, who, of course, hated Casement. 
and his diaries are then used with his full and enthusiastic support as the basis for, uh, for the lies about casement. And this is only discovered and pointed out by Irish scholars at the turn of the 20th century and has since never yet been acknowledged by a single British scholar. Has not been acknowledged by a Brit single British scholar. Several more points. The British offer casement a very strange offer when he has been already been convicted of treason and is going to be hanged by the neck until dead. They say to him, admit that the black diaries which we have claimed are written by you are yours and we will spur your life. They offer him that deal and Casement, a man of honor to the very end, turns down the deal, right? Now, why would he turn down the deal if he'd actually done these things in the first place? And why do they need to offer him the deal? You see, the black diaries, which were exposed to the whole world in 1916, only extracts for them are shown, and uh, more than half a century later, bad photo photographs and photocopies of them are, uh, are displayed. They have never been exposed to independent forensic analysis in Ireland or at the United Nations or the, or the International Court at The Hague or uh, by any international authority whatsoever, by, uh, or even any British authority, let alone Irish one whatsoever. Why haven't they been released? For, if they are genuine, why haven't they been released for exposure in the last 106 years? It's like looking at released CIA documents in the Kennedy assassination. There are tens of thousands of them but most of them have all the key parts blacked out. As I have said to this group before, and I've taught all my life, you can cover up anything, but it is impossible to cover up the cover up. And the fact of the cover up proves the reality that there is a secret, whatever it is, and it's usually very easy to, to uh, uh, all you have to do is find out who's do, authorizing and directing and controlling the cover up. And you know, what do they have to cover up? And the rest is pure deduction, Watson. The rest should be easy. And this is the case with, uh, with the infamous Casement Diaries. Finally, Casement has been a Protestant all his life. But on the night before he dies, or the morning actually that he is executed, I think it's the night before, he makes full confession and he joins the Catholic faith. The priest who takes his confession honors the secrets of the confessional afterwards and will not expose them. Rightly so, this is the tradition of the church. But he does say this, I never met a more noble or upright or honorable or finer human being in all of my life. And he simply would not have said that if he had just received the confessions of a child, of, of a serial uh, child molester. He would not have done so. He would not have done so. So what happens to this great, extraordinary, good, fearless man? Betrayed by even many of his friends, though not all of them, at the very end. He is buried in a traitor's grave in the Tower of London in London for 49 years. But that is not the end of the story. Remember the short, ridiculous little clip I showed you at the beginning? And remember how I told you how even it was a lie? First of all, Caseman... There is one extraordinary survivor of the Irish national uh, movement in 1916. Eamon de Valera, already in his 30s, exceptionally brave, heroic, admirable le uh, 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 leader of the men who, who defended one of the stronghold positions in the city of Dublin in 1916, is not hanged by the British because his, his mother is American. And the British are terrified of making an American martyr that will bring America into the war on Germany's side. So de Valera is spurred and de Valera lives to become the political diplomatic genius who helps lead the Irish national movement in the War of Independence. And by the way, has anyone here seen the movie Michael Collins? And I'm a great admirer of Michael Collins. But the movie is a travesty. It is another lie from the other extreme. It is shown not to... Uh, what's the word, discredit the Irish Republican movement. But, and it, it is made to glamorize heroically the great Michael Collins, who is played marvelously in the movie by the great Liam Neeson. 
but the movie is specifically made to discredit Eamon de Valera. And they did so very brilliantly. They got an actor who specializes in playing villains to play him. The wonderful British actor, I love him in everything he does, and last no long with us, Alan Rickman, who is actually a part Irish descent himself. Alan Rickman play, uh, 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 played the Sheriff of Nottingham in the 1989 movie Robin Hood. Anyone here ever see the movie Die Hard? He plays Hans, the, e e uh, the, the evil German terrorist who's Bruce Willis's arch enemy in, in Die Hard. And he's wonderful in the movie, one of the best you know, uh, the movie villains of all time. Bruce Willis, who thought the world of Alan Rickman, was asked what was the secret of the enormous global success of Die Hard, and it's up to this day enormous popularity, undying popularity. He said, I can answer in two words, Alan Rickman. And this is the guy they get to play De Valera. And they get him to play Dev as a cowardly, sinister, two-faced piece of shit. Whereas De Valera was the opposite of that. It's not to say he was always admirable. I grew up under De Valera in Ireland. And I lived to cover Menachem Begin becoming prime minister in Israel as a young reporter. And even in those days, I had the knack to enrage powerful people. I enraged Begin so much with an article I wrote about him, basically calling him an idiot, uh, and a, a dangerous idiot at that, that while he was on a plane flying to Oslo to receive his, the Nobel Peace Prize, the proudest moment of Begin's life. And he flew into a rage on the plane. A friend of mine was the Washington Post diplomatic correspondent who was flying on the plane that day, gave me the full story afterwards. And afterwards, I was banned from ever having access to the prime minister's office in Jerusalem as long as Begin was prime minister of Israel. So even in my early 20s, I had the gift of, in, uh, uh, of being idiotic enough to enrage powerful assholes, right? And there you are. But when you look at Begin and De Valera, they're very similar. They both lead resistance movements. They both do disgusting and outrageous things. They both also capable of the most extraordinary act of generosity and decency that you would never imagine of them. They're both pain in the necks to everyone. De Valera, like De Gaulle, is a long, thin string bean of a man. He and De Gaulle admired each other enormously, incidentally and ungainly ugly. Dev, uh, uh, Began had bad teeth and was an extremely small, uh, ugly and ridiculous little twit as well. I described him as a, Polish, a uh, as a frustrated Polish gentleman with dreams of grandeur, which he was, which is why he hated the description so much. In Devil Air, but Began was also the man who when Vietnam collapsed and the Vietnamese boat people could not get a home anywhere in the world, allowed several hundred of them to come to Israel as penniless refugees, even though they weren't Jewish and had no connection with the state whatsoever or the Jewish people. And when he was asked why he did it, he said, I come from a people who are a homeless people who could find a home nowhere for thousands of years. I know what it feels like. I felt we had to at least do something. That was the other side of Begin. And De Valera had that quality too. This is a man who on the one hand can go to the German consulate in April 1945 and give the German government his condolences on the death of Hitler when he had refused to do so on the death of Franklin Roosevelt only a three weeks before because he hated Roosevelt for making common cause with Churchill uh, when he thought he should have made it with Ireland instead. This is how petty De Valera could be. And yet this same man, first of all, authorizes full U.S. and Irish intelligence cooperation with American uh, intelligence with the OSS to prevent the Abwehr uh, sinking Western convoys and killing American sailors and soldiers in World War II. Irish uh, deep state co cooperation with the United States against the Nazis was a model of cooperation in World War II. That's the first admirable thing he did. And secondly, in 1965, it is 49 years since uh, Roger Casement has been betray betrayed by his own Irish Republican Brotherhood, as well as by the British state he served so well and so loyally and so outstandingly for so long to be buried in shame in a traitor's grave after being hanged as a traitor in the Tower of London in, 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 in England, right? And De Valera, as, as president of Ireland, convinces the British government to allow uh, 
Casement's body to be brought back to Ireland. Now, what could be more ridiculous? To give a man a state funeral in a country of only two and a half million people? 49 years after he was dead? They had to send forensic experts to, to check the bones and the age of the bones. And this is before DNA testing to verify they even had the right skeleton to bring back to Ireland. Do you see how ridiculous and pathetic this sounds? And when you saw that clip, I, I had Matt run at the beginning of this presentation. What does it look like? It looks like a nice, dignified, quiet, private little ceremony maybe 20 or 30 people watching, right? Maybe 100 people watching even. An honorable, dignified saint up for an obscure, forgotten man. Before he was buried, the bones of Roger Casement in a, a state casket were on display in Glasnevin Military Cemetery in Dublin for one week. And during that week, 665,000 people, one in three of the entire population of Ireland, man, women, and child, filed past that coffin in silent tribute to the greatest Irishman and one of the greatest human beings who ever lived. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marty. I, uh, that was, uh, that was good. That was, there's a lot in there, a lot in there. Um, I guess I, I'll, I have one little question from my thought, my, my brain, and, um, we're going to open up for maybe 35 minutes, maybe 40 minutes of Q and a, but, but unfortunately around five ten or so, we're going to have to stop. So we'll, we'll hopefully, sure. Uh, make the Q, the Q's and the A's uh, as as concise so everyone can get their their questions in. I just had, a, I guess, the for brief... me as you know, but I'll try, Matt. Yeah. <laughs> um, I guess the only a quick question I had maybe is a bit more of a factoid. Um, in your research of of Casement and and uh, his organization, the was it that ba that backstab the IRB. Uh, did Alistair Crowley um, also and or Cloud Dancy? Uh, play a role since I know uh, Crowley in uh, my research lately that's taken me down uh, into a book called Secret Agent 666. Um, he was a double agent acting like he was a pro pro German, pro Irish Republican, pro Indian freedom fighter and gained the trust, I think, at a certain point of, of casement. Um, but probably played a role I'm, I'm thinking in hearing you in uh, the sabotage of what casement was doing um do you know did so did crowley come in and also did claude dancy and and both crowley and dancy are working closely in you know the sleepy hollow secret espionage blue blood establishment agency in in uh, new york um so yeah just quick uh, I, I, I cannot add anything to you. In fact, you have added to me. I knew nothing of Crowley's involvement. I can confirm Dancy's involvement. It was very high profile. Uh, another key figure was, uh, I think it's Basil Johnson. Uh, uh, Churchill was involved later, though at, at the actual time when Casement is uh, uh, judicially uh, convicted and hanged, Churchill was actually literally away from it. He, uh, his reputation was in tatters after he had forced the Gallipoli disaster, which, which killed 150,000 uh, uh, British subjects, especially Australians and New Zealanders, as well as Brits and many others. So he was actually served on the Western Front at the time, but Churchill's best friend, F. E. Smith, Lord Birkenhead, who died in 1929, who was the solic uh, Solicitor General at the time in the coalition government, who became that, was uh, was a central figure in pushing for this as well. Uh, the, the secret state was definitely involved. I knew nothing of uh, Crowley's involvement, I think, I, I, I do not doubt for a second it's true. Crowley had his finger in so many pies. He was also involved with John Parsons in, uh, in the setting up the Jet Propulsion Laboratory after World War II. It's extraordinary how far uh, Crowley's sinister web went. So I, I look forward to, to talking with you and learning from you on this, Matt. Uh, and I, 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 uh, I look into aspects of it as, as well. And if I find anything, we'll let you know. But this is news to me, but that is not to pour 
for the slightest doubt on what you say. I'm sure it's all true. And I can independently confirm Dancy's very high level participation. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay, I'll, I'll send you a link to this book. Uh, it's worth you picking up. And, and the whole like um, dispute between Yeats and W.B. B. Yeats and, and Crowley as well at the uh, the Order oh, of the yes, Golden Dawn. Oh, yes, that's a huge thing. Absolutely. Yeah, I know. That it does play into it a little bit. So it's, it's interesting to to sort of just have a little bit of that motion in the in the well, mind. By the way, there is another aspect with Yeats, since you mentioned Yeats. Yeats was a close personal friend of Casement's no, I know. and tried yeah, in vain to yeah. save his life. And after, decades after Casement died, Yeats was still loyal to Casement and hmm. wrote a poem about the ghost of Roger Casement and how Roger Casement still haunted Ireland. Interesting. Okay, cool. Um, I feel that Magdalena's question is going to be quicker uh, than Maureen, so I'm going to ask Meg, uh, Magdalena, uh, do you want to just ask your question about Emily? Yeah. Um, I had recently given a class on the Boer War, uh, Marty, and um, Emily Hophouse came up in that as being one of the people exposing this whole atrocity in uh, South Africa. And I was wondering, because they're kind of around the same time, if Emily ha ha um, Hophouse would know um, Roger Casement. I believe so, yes. I believe they were friends. Uh, I'm not an expert on this. Uh, I would advise. I, I will look into this. And if uh, if you, uh, Magdalena, if you pass your email to uh, to uh, Matt uh, to pass on to me, I can either send you directly or I can uh, send you through Matt. Either is fine. But I look into this. I cannot confirm it off the top of my head. But I believe that actually they were friends and over many and, co and cooperated over many years on Irish Republican and other issues. I, I believe on the anti-imperialism issue, uh, they saw very much alike. I, I do know, I just recently found this out, that uh, Emily Hophouse went, um, tried to stop World War I by actually going to France and then to Switzerland. And then she actually went directly to Berlin, okay, to try to intervene in, uh, in the situation, try to create a, um, a negotiated a ne negotiation. Uh, but she was not taken seriously by her own government, Great Britain. Uh, she was called big eccentric. Um, yeah, I guess that's that's the fate of uh, uh, women who were not married, right? It's but. also the fate of, of all principal anti-war activists. It was the fate of Einstein, it was the fate of Bertrand Russell, it was the fate of the Pope, it was and the American Secretary of State. And the great socialist leader Jean Jarret, who was assassinated on the eve of war in circumstances which have never been investigated properly. Mm. Maureen. Gosh, Marty, thanks for that. That is opening up a huge vista. OMG, really. Um, okay. So let me launch in with one comment and or several comments and questions. Um, first off, yeah, the uh, Aleister Crowley thing, he had his finger in everybody's pie. And there is a deeply occult aspect to the upper echelons, which would make sense as to why they would have considered somebody like Crowley of use. And that goes on many different levels. And the information Crowley had about their own competitors and their own ilk would have been extremely valuable. So you can see why, you know, he would have been appropriated, expropriated by a lot of people uh, on a lot of sides. Um, so that was my comment about that. Quick comment about Hemingway. Um, uh, one of my friend's father uh, was one of him, him uh, was one of uh, the teachers of that generation and uh, art teachers of that generation. Uh, Brit called uh, William Stanley Hayter, and uh, he actually taught Picasso. Um, and I'm blanking out on it's a type of printing, etching. Um, anyway, so he knew the whole crowd and he was a sort of had communist leanings. So he knew Hemingway and uh, one of Hemingway's stunts, which is kind of interesting. There was a hotel in the Spanish Revolution uh, that was bombed. And so the front of the hotel uh, 
was sheared off by a bomb. And Hemingway was very good at being in safety zones when anything like that happened. He was a yes. good self-promoter. And so what he did was, like, after the building was bombed, he put himself in one of the rooms and sat there, and I guess either he or somebody took pictures of him as having looking like he'd actually been in the building when the bomb went off. He was nowhere near it. He just, you know, uh, appropriated the scene for, for himself uh, to build his public image. And he did a lot of stuff like that. People who knew him well, who were actually smart, creative people at the time, could tell you a lot of stories about him. So I love your comments about Hemingway. Conrad, amazing writer, an amazing writer. And I always marvel to me that somebody from Poland could write English that well. Awesome. Totally, people do not realize or give Conrad the credit that's his due. Wow, I'm glad you brought that up. Then I was just going to mention um, Gray. Uh, yeah, some people used to call him uh, Lord Asquist's, one of Lord Asquist's noughts. And that's very interesting because that also shows you how that system works and what was done behind the scenes to become germophobic during that period uh, and create and involve uh, and create a war against Germany uh, for which there was no reason at that time, except it was for certain vested interests, very much a reason. So you have these knots who allow the movers and the shakers to remain invisible. So I was really thrilled that you brought up his name. And then lastly, I was just going to say, and then you can, you know, please comment, contradict or whatever, if you would like, but um, the, the, the difficulty with the elites, if you take Masaryk as one example, but you could do it with the other elites too, you know, Nobody's nobody is clean in all the choices that they exactly. make. Exactly. And, and and so you could take a Masaryk who might have thought a Woodrow Wilson was a dope, but needed to move a political agenda to establish exactly. a state. And which does not make Masaryk an unarrogant person in spite of his extraordinary writings. But certain things have to move on, I would like to say, for a, predestin a predestination human evolution, because I like to be a positivist. And so you use the material that's available. So anyway, so I wanted to put that in. And lastly, I was going to ask you, because I'll tell people things about Woodrow Wilson and everybody says, oh, no, he was a brilliant man. So I would love it if you could recommend the book that I could pass on that really tells a story about Woodrow Wilson. Thank you. That's all I have to say about that. Oh, bless you. There's a whole bunch of books on Woodrow Wilson. There's a new book, and I forget its author, and he's a beautiful writer, called The Madman in the White House, which tells the story of how Sigmund Freud cooperated with the great American diplomat, FDR's ambassador to both France and the Soviet Union, William Bullitt, in the 1930s, and together they wrote a psychological book study and biography of Sigmund Freud. And the book was so abusive to Woodrow Wilson that it has not been allowed to be released fully to this day. You can find a heavily cut, boring version of it that came out, but the most interesting and devastating parts of it were not published. Secondly, there is a wonderful book, actually consciously sympathetic to Wilson, but nevertheless devastatingly revealing about him, by the wonderful American popular historian called Jean Smith, G-E-N-E -E Smith, and it's called When the Cheering Stopped. The, the Wilson story is quite extraordinary. And again, uh, not necessary for me, you might be a better person to do it, or Steve, or who knows, uh, but someone in the group should do it. This man, at the end of World War I, was the most popular human being in the world, 
and arguably the most popular human being who had ever lived to that time, who was regarded with his theories of self-determination of having brought the secret of eternal peace and happiness to the human race. And he's an asshole. And he's a racist. He's a very ugly racist. He looks at the movie Birth of a Nation in 1915, uh, a racist movie in which the Ku Klux Klan are the heroes, and every uh, African-American individual in the movie is portrayed as a monstrous ape who uh, rapes uh, and, and murders white blonde virgins. And Woodrow Wilson in the White House praises this horrific concoction, as bad as anything Hitler and Streicher ever produced about the Jewish people, as, you know, a work of art that will live forever, and it is all so terribly, terribly true. Wilson is an abomination. Oh, see, he also gave us the income tax, incidentally. And the irony is, in the 1930s, the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, which was the term used to describe the four members of the Supreme Court who were determined to destroy Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal, had all been appointed by Wilson. They had not been appointed by conservative Republican presidents. They had all been appointed by FDR's old boss. So Wilson is a vile, inept, incompetent creature. And FTR in his, never says this publicly, but he says this repeatedly to his friends and colleagues and family in World War II, when they're asking, why did you bring Republicans into the government here? Why did you do things this way? Why are you keeping MacArthur there? You know, why are you doing all these things this way when you're not supporting the Democratic Party? You're not being partisan. And FTR always gives the same answer. He says, I learned from watching Wilson in World War I how not to do these things. How not to do these things. So Wilson, everything Wilson did was a catastrophe. And FDR studies him, and maybe not even immediately at the time, but on reflection and continued study over the years, determines to everything, do everything the opposite way that Wilson had done. He has nothing but contempt for Wilson. And he doesn't show it publicly because, again, he's a, like Frank, uh, uh, Ben Franklin. He knows uh, uh, when it is necessary to present a lie for the greater good, just as you were saying before about Masaryk. Okay. These are going pretty fast. I'm, I'm, I'm impressed. Thank I didn't you. think it was going to happen. Um, so... If anybody else has a thought or a question, now would be the time to throw it out at Marty. I have an observation. Um, I was recently looking a lot more than I had ever done before at uh, Steed, WT Steed, uh, because I was, I'm, we're preparing, Cynthia and I just finished the script for episode two of our, our Hidden Hand Behind UFO series. And this one's going to focus on H.G. Wells and the War of the Worlds and the mind of H.G. Wells. So we had to kind of go into this nasty place of uh yeah, it, that we didn't I mean, want to go i into. loved as a kid reading world of stuff but oh yeah same, yeah so, no yeah, you're, the point guy. is you're right he's so depressing everything he writes gives doesn't give you dreams it gives you nightmares yeah 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 no it, it, it is entertaining uh but he's really like laying out the formula that they've used in throughout the entire 20th yes yes century yes in uh in predictive programming it's, it's quite something but then looking at his i was surprised to find out that it wasn't sci-fi that he started writing it was actually science that he was writing in nature magazine uh as he uh finished his work with thomas huxley who groomed him and so he went to work with nature magazine doing science work writing science textbooks and then he started working uh with paul mall gazette under steve for a number of years alongside annie besant and so steed and besant steed, steed is very close to besant and you know she's somebody who's a eugenicist playing a key role become going from oh, a to uh to theosophists we should talk about the theosophists at some time they lead directly into hitler and the holocaust oh yeah 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 and the fact that i think every all of these assets who who any Besant built up with Ledbetter in uh, in india in the congress party that ended up working with the nazis happily is interesting as well uh that's super interesting gandhi was all for the nazis who oh gandhi yeah, yes Mohandas Gandhi, yeah, first of all, he calls on the Jews to end the persecution problem by committing mass suicide oh, really? and thereby winning the respect of the world. Then he tells the British people that the key to their, uh, their happiness and survival is to surrender unconditionally and accept full enslavement. That's the term he used, full enslavement by Hitler in 1940. 
After the atomic bomb is exploded over Japan in 1945, Gandhi's reaction is it was a tragedy. It had not been developed by India because then they could have used it against Britain. No. This is the great apostle of nonviolence. He said that? Yes, he's on the record. His grandson became head of the Indian atomic web uh, 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 bomb building program. Oh, Homi Baba. Is that Homi Baba or who? I think so. Hmm. I've forgotten. And I, at my age, I, I apologize for get, forgetting him, but it's worth looking into. No, it's not Homi Baba. It's else. Yes. Uh, that's interesting. Though. Okay. That's, that's wild. Uh, so my, my whole point, though, was just that I'm, I was getting a different sense because of Steed's relationship with Cecil Rhodes, you know, as a propagandist for the Roundtable movement. Uh, Rhodes bankrolled the whole Palmwell Gazette, Gazette operation. And it seems like... Oh, Milner, yes, absolutely. These guys all cultivated this thing called social socialist imperialism. And Milner right. You know, br went right into the Sidney Beatrice Webb networks and became a socialist imperialist. And they all chose to, like, take that approach versus all of the old school imperialists that were more fire and brimstone, like, just kill, kill the natives. Though they were still doing that too, um, and I, when I was looking at the the pedophile rings in London, it, I was getting the sense that Steed walked into it into something as far as a, a trap. And when he was in trial, that's the first time he read out his his twenty page defense of himself, saying that he was doing this to expose the British. You government. know more about this than and me. Then, so I, I, I'm sure then, you're right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because it was crazy because it was only after that that the judge was like, no, this is disgusting. And they, he stopped him after like getting through half a page. And then Steed obviously went and published his whole 20, 20 page defense, which like set into motion the entire propaganda or the, yes. the, the yes. program to raise the age of consent um, and then make him a hero. But it seems like he was looking at like who he was just enmeshed with, with Leadbeater, these rampant pedophiles, the theosophists are managing pedophile operations in India. It, it seems like, and also Cecil Rhodes, obviously doing the same thing with Milner and these pedophile groups in Africa. It seems like Steed was really, he was just caught with his pants down, literally. That's my take, at least. And then he- I think you're probably, I think that is probably true. Yeah. You know, again, much more about it than I do. I am very, uh, I yield to your superior knowledge on this, but from my much more limited knowledge, I have the sense you are absolutely correct. Cool, yes, I win, all right. <laughs> absolutely. But uh, no, it was great. And I, I love what you did because it, it's so important to, especially coming from British Canada and trying to understand history, it's so important to look at these types, these personality types that are, are sort of walking into worlds and are often disruptive because their conscience will start scratching at them and they'll start yes. like breaking from the formula that they're expected to abide by and uh, do things that are completely disruptive to the grand strategy. It, it's it's so important to to look at these, these personalities and Casement is, he just exemplifies this in such an interesting way and it's so nuanced and it's really difficult for people to like walk in this realm of gray uh to appreciate these these personalities because we all want a hero and a villain that's very clear cut like a comic book and it's like no reality we do sometimes have those but more often than not we have a lot of these these gray creatures who will who will then end up just you know again abiding by conscience and uh and acting according to something that is that is good when they're not supposed to and breaking from their profiles. So uh, yeah, Casement's story is high value. If I may, you remind me again, it's something I brought up in previous sessions in different contexts, but there's a wonderful example of this in Shakespeare's Richard III. And of course, I, again, I'm a classic Marlowian, as you know, I believe that Marlowe was in the close, uh, in fact, that his longtime love and mistress was in fact a princess, the daughter of illegitimate daughter of Queen Elizabeth I. But he's certainly mixed in the highest circles. The highest figures in England are, can be easily identified in his plays at the time. I mean, there's even modern pattern for this. If you look at all the classic Mon Monty Python sketches, they are all based not on abstract imagination. If you grew up in Britain in the 1950s and 60s, you knew who these people were and everybody did. The Piranha Brothers, remember the famous gangsters? They were the Cray Brothers who practiced in providing children in child prostitution rings. And they did so to War Minister John Profumo, who was forced to resign in 1963. And their longest time associate was the late John Profumo, again, the war minister, but also Lord Robert Boothby, who was the longtime lover 
and father of one of the children, uh, uh, the children of the wife of Prime Minister Harold Macmillan. Macmillan was undersexed. His wife Dorothy was oversexed. She despised her husband. She spent all her time with Boothby. Boothby spent half his time with her and half the rest of his time with little boys provided by the Cray brothers. Mm -hmm. And the Cray brothers are the model for the Piranha brothers, right? Yeah. Now, in the case of Shakespeare, what sets me off on this is in Richard III, you have the Duke of Buckingham, Richard's drinking companion and right-hand man. He's like the evil Tonto to Richard III's demented Lone Ranger, right? His loyal sidekick and everything. And they're toppling the constitution of Britain. They're seizing national power. They're framing innocent men like Lord Hastings for crimes they did not commit. They're even murdering a, a, a royal prince, the, the king's brother. And Buckingham goes along with us perfectly happily. And uh, as a result, Richard becomes king. And what's the first thing Richard... To, uh, and Buckingham is delighted. And he says, well, my lord, now we can steal the whole country. Can't we? Isn't that grand? What's the first thing we can? We, you want to do, boss? And Richard says, I want the bastards dead. The two sons of the previous king, Edward IV, the princes in the tower. And Buckingham is shocked in the text. It's in the writing. But why so, my great lord? You know, they're harmless, you know? They're no threat to you. They're no threat to us. They're a joke. And we've got them locked up. Why bother? You know? And people might not like it. Kill them, Buckingham. Oh, but my lord, I have to be out of town. And Buckingham is, is shocked by his own decency. He has limits and restrictions that, he, that even he will not go beyond. Hmm. Look. In uh, 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 25 year, years ago, I, I'd been in Washington 15 years. I thought I'd seen it all. I found nothing could shock me. I thought I could cynically more or less cover as long as I wasn't part of whatever the latest outrage was. I'd just either cover it or refuse to cover it and just stay apart from it. But I could okay, stay silent. And then they planned the war in Iraq. And I found that, uh, what's the word, uh, uh, conspiracy to wage aggressive war. I regard it as a monstrous crime. My mum and my uncles and aunties in Belfast, sweet, harmless, quiet people, had been bombed out of their house by the Nazis in World War II. The idea of another war rightly appalled them. They had inner courage and strength, but they had been traumatized by the war. And I thought of these people who I loved and the suffering they had gone through, and here are these pathetic, contemptible cowards and assholes with their instant, uh, uh, instant coffee Maxwell House recipe for the perfection of the human race that's going to come immediately as long as we get control of the oil of Iraq. And of course, make themselves billionaires at the same time, all for the greater good, right? And I was like Buckingham. I thought, my God, I surprise myself that there are actually limits beyond which I will not go or which I will not be silent about or which I will not tolerate. And I was taken by surprise by that. And eventually that led me to you guys. So you're right. This happens to a surprisingly often extent. Human decency is an X factor that often surprises the people who have it. It often surprises the people who express it. Mm hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's not. I, I think that's a perfect way to to see it. Um, all right, we have five minutes. If there's any pressing last thoughts that people have pressing against their their chests, trying to get out, now is the time to let it out. I think Marty, you've you've given people a lot to think about. You've satisfied a lot of questions. You've you've in induced a lot more questions. Ah, shit! I was just about to wrap it up. Okay, Ma Monty is squeezed in. Good job. All right, go for it, Monty. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, thank you very much, Mark. Just absolutely fascinating. I'm just totally... Uh, uh, thank you, Lee. Thank you. painted that Bertrand Russell in somewhat of a favorable light. Uh, and I'm wondering the different roles he might have played, with, you know, insofar as historically, writing Principal Mathematica and actually being central to basically uh, the whole game theory and information technology and a lot of what we're seeing today could you comment on that please and so far was he deconstructed somehow or uh 
I'm not an expert on this. I would, on most matters, Russell, I would yield without hesitation to both Matt and Cynthia. They uh, have uncovered dimensions of of him I did not suspect, and I fully respect. Uh, He was a loathsome human being. There's no question about that. He comes from the height of British society. He comes from a family of Whigs. His his grandfather was a key figure responsible for the Irish famine as Prime Minister, Lord uh, John Russell. So he's the grandson of a master of genocide. He himself is one is the inadvertent, I think, creator of some of the greatest poetry we ever know for a very selfish and cruel reason. He had an affair with the already unstable wife of T.S. Eliot, and she never and then he dumped her. And it broke her mind. It broke her sanity. She never recovered from the way Bertrand Russell had treated her. And as a result, she made Per Elliot miserable. And because Per Elliot was miserable, we have the wasteland. And we have much else as well. And of course, Elliot ends his life paradoxically a happy man. First, because he remarries a second wife who's very good for him and very different from the first one. A similar tale, incidentally, to Evil and War. And also like War, he is or becomes devoutly old-fashioned traditional Catholic Christian. And so Eliot finds both uh, spiritual as well as emotional uh, grounding and stability later in life. But what we, we regard as some of his most moving and profound poetry comes because Russell is basically a psychopath and breaks his wife. And if you, uh, I, I, there is a very unsympathetic portrait of Russell by another liberal intellectual, a very interesting one, Paul Johnson, in his book, Intellectuals, has a chapter on Russell, who he knew personally. And he loathed Russell, loathed him. But it's worth reading him on that too. Russell was also like Lord Palmerston in Britain, in that they were both described as satyrs, S-A-T-Y-Rs, you know, the creatures from Greek myth who would basically jump on and leap and rape anything female at all, from a baboon to a beautiful woman. Right. And this was definitely Russell. But at the same time, Russell sees through Lenin sooner than anyone else does. He never falls for Hitler. Uh, uh, I stand to be correct on that, but I I believe so. And whether he believes in truth or of falseness and also in opposing the threat of nuclear in the nuclear age, too, he covers every base. He actually urges a preventive nuclear war on Russia in the 1940s when we have the bomb and they do not. But as as soon as they get the bomb, he says, logic compels us. Now we have uh, they got it too soon. We should have nuked them before. But now we have to have peace with them because rationally, the only alternative to peace is the extermination of the human race. So Russell is a strange amalgam between a fearless mind, incredibly powerful mind that sees everything, and also an utterly self-indulgent psychopath. And Paul Johnson, I'm not an expert on Russell, but Paul Johnson, I recall, has a very interesting insight on Russell. He says Russell is a bit like Doctor Who. Russell wants to be, or an artificial intelligence, he wants to be a brilliant, rational, logical machine. And he keeps being driven to madness by the fact that his own ego, his own sexual drive and desires, his own pettiness and vanity, in other words, his own human limitations, his own human drives, he hates the fact that he is human. And he wants to be above it, and he knows he can't be. So Russell is not a stable or recommended figure, but he has his moments. Thank you. Oh, Maureen, I, I see that you're you're trying to say something, Maureen, but I only sorry. see that you're trying to say something. Oh, there you go. Okay, so, sorry, sorry. This is your uh, computer genius speaking now. Um, S- M- Marty, I was going to ask you something, your insight. Russell is as you describe him, but he also will put himself in jail and get tortured. So I, I wonder if that is a part of the, uh, psychopath, uh, profile, because that gives another aspect to something that looks heroic, but maybe something entirely different. I don't think so. I mean, you may be right. Again, in my case, insufficient data, 
and an underrated writer I adore, and who I've spoken on to this group, thanks to Matt, is Agatha Christie. And Agatha Christie has her Atavar, who's really her spokeswoman, much more than Poirot, Miss Marple, uh, say in one case, you know, uh, uh, about what someone does, everyone agrees it's a mystery why they did it. And then Miss Marple comments, but then we all are, aren't we? We're all mysteries to ourselves. Now, if you look at Tolstoy and Hemingway, you see phony written over all of them, over both of them. I don't see that on Russell. And Russell likes the good life. And he, he's an aristocrat and he makes no secret about it. And he doesn't, this is the rest of his life. He, 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 he'll travel to America to escape persecution in Britain. You know, uh, he'll take the fattest cat positions in American universities. Uh, but there's a positive side to that. It means that Russell, at least, is rational. Uh, uh, to me, there's a lot of the phony play actor in Gandhi. Hemingway is full of it. And if I may, just before we close, a wonderful Hemingway, uh, uh, not even a story, but that should have been a story about him. Uh, one of my favorite satirists of the 20th century, well known in Britain, and totally unknown in America. I'm not sure about Canada. Uh, was a fellow called Michael Wharton who wrote for 50 years for the Daily Telegraph. He was a conservative satirist, and he wrote the Peter Simple column called the Way of the World column. He found about Peter Simple. And he, he, uh, he, he presents himself in Peter Simple as this very aristocratic man of the world who's been everywhere and done everything and known everyone and this, that, and the other. And it, it, of course, it's, it's all a fake. I mean, you know, he lived in Hammersmith in West London, took the number 77 bus to work in the Daily Telegraph building every day and back, had fish fingers for supper. You know, he, he he was basically a lower working class and an enthusiastic drunk, as most journalists of my generation were. But uh, he's a great satirist, and he talks, uh, he has a column somewhere where uh, he invents the column, right? But it's supposedly Hemingway boasting to everyone how tough he was, and how in a visit to the English seaside resort of Bournemouth in 1923, Hemingway boasts that he, he murdered two elderly grandmothers in a bar fight when they were sitting in their wheelchairs, right? Uh, I stress it isn't supposed to have really happened, but, you know, it, it sounds more true than it could have happened. And the way Hemingway describes it, Peter Simple writes, Hemingway says, they were tough. The two elderly grandmothers in their wheelchairs. But I was tougher. And once you've read that and remember that, you cannot take seriously anything Hemingway ever writes again. Now, with Evelyn Waugh and George Orwell, it is the opposite. Here you have the caricature of the self-effacing English gentleman taken to the other degree by people who were fearless, who were, uh, who did go to the absolute corners of hell and record what happened there. I mean, can you imagine a passionate, romantic 1920s love story? And spoiler alert, I'm making a spoiler alert here. At the end of a book nobody will ever read today because it is called Black Mischief by Evelyn Waugh, right? And at the end of the novel, the hero accidentally eats the heroine. She has been murdered by the tribe. He has come to rescue her from a tribe, and they offer him a, a banquet as the great visiting white man from the central government, right? And he doesn't realize he's, this delicious stew he's drinking is his own girlfriend. Because war had already visited Ethiopia, where he said the two great passions in the 1920s were cannibalism and Christianity. Now, what do you say to a man like that, who has been there, who has seen paradoxes and unbelievable horrors like this to their face, and then made jokes about them? This is the opposite of Hemingway. This is the opposite of Hemingway. He writes a classic World War II novel in which his hero spends most of the war trying to save an innocent Jewish couple from the Nazis and succeeds in occupied Yugoslavia in World War II, only to discover afterwards that they have been shot by the communists as British spies because they had been seen with him. Now, this kind of thing happened all the time, but it takes an enormous 
moral, mental courage to say the world can truly be this awful and this ugly and this ironic. And I, as an individual, or I, as the writer, might have caused some of this and then admit it in public and then turn it into great art. You know, uh, it's, it's like a great Renaissance painter producing a, a, a great crucifixion. Wow. You know, you find none of this in Hemingway. And again, I'm, I'm moving a long way from Russell. Never, Russell was never going to be a, a martyr that way. But when he was young, no, I, I think that was sincere. Because the one thing about, the, the, the two things about Russell that I think are key are this, his arrogance and, uh, and what goes with it, his aristocratic background. His grandfather had run the British Empire when it was the greatest empire in the history of the world. His grandfather had blotted out two and a half million Irish lives without b- batting an eyelid. Right. And Russell was that kind of man. And Russell believed in evolution and, and loved Darwin. Russell thrived in the idea of a merciless, meaningless world. But he was brave. None of the rest of them were. What Russell believed, I, I don't want to let Russell off the intellectual hook. I think the bill of goods that you and Cynthia, of all people especially, have brought against Russell has needed to be brought against him for the last hundred years. And it is correct in every detail. But at least he had balls. He had backbone and he had balls. And that is not completely nothing because Nietzsche had neither. By the way, Harry Turtledove, sometimes while reacting here, we're about to close, writes a wonderful short alternative history story in which Nietzsche goes to the American West to cure his uh, tuberculosis, right? Which he had dreamed of doing in real life, but of course didn't have the guts to do. But in the American West, not only is his tuberculosis cured, but he becomes an expert gunman. Well, he's German after all of that generation. And he kills Doc Holliday, becomes Wyatt Herp's uh, 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 sidekick instead. And so he, he's at Wyatt Herp's side, uh, uh, known as the fearsome Ger- German gunfighter, German Fred, in the gunfight of the OK Corral. Now, isn't it a genius who can come up with that? Uh, incidentally, again, while reacting, Wyatt Earp is buried in the Jewish cemetery in San Francisco, the Jewish cemetery, alongside his wife, Sadie Earp, a Jewish prostitute of the time, right? And they were together for about 50 years. And the reason, uh, one of the major reasons John Ford's Westerns are so compelling and apparently accurate is that he was a close friend of Wyatt Earp for 20 years till Wyatt Earp died and was a Paul Burr at his, at his funeral. And the gunfight in his, uh, his daughter, uh, in his, uh, 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 you know, his darling Clementine, the version of the fact gunfight at OK Corral, if you look at the version with Kurt Douglas and uh, uh, Bert Lancaster, the quintessential Hollywood version, it lasts about 15 minutes. There's epic music playing in the background. You know, it's really epic stuff, right? But in the John Ford version, it's over in 20 seconds because Wyatt Earp told John Ford that's the way it really was. You had to kill them fast at point blank range and shoot them several times to make sure you'd got them and they wouldn't shoot back. And then it was over. It was it was lightning execution. It wasn't a classic gun fight at all. That's the way it really happened. And he got this not just from an eyewitness, but from the guy who did it. So sometimes the interaction between fantasy and fact is totally misleading. And other times it's misleading because it's so accurate and you don't realize that. You're a fun guy, Marty. I like you. <laughs> it's mutual, man. And to, to, to everyone else here, thank you, folks. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Marty. Thank you, everyone. Next week, we're going to come back with uh, David Goslin, who's going to go into some uh, Mind Wars material. It'll be fun, some poetry as well. I'm sure he'll weave it all in. We'll have some good conversations. So next week, 2 p.m., see you all then. Take care. Well, I hope so. Bye, y'all. Thank you, Matt. Thanks, Bye, Marty. Guys.